morning and welcome. It's Friday, June 23rd. This is Midnight's Edge in the morning. Happy Friday to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good late night to all of you joining us from across the pond. I am Mexican Iron Man, co-piloting today's show and with the boss man, of course. How are you, sir? I am doing excellent. Greetings, everyone. Another week has reached its end. We have more episodes of uh, Star Trek, a brand new Marvel Disney Plus series. We'll be reviewing it all for you. We'll be talking some Star Wars, and oh boy, do we have a show for you. And I am not uh, I am not alone, of course, uh, until Tom joins, uh, who will be here soon, uh, helping me on the MC services is, of course, Mexican Iron Man. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. It's been a it's been a news packed uh, summer, news packed week. Stuff movies are coming out. Uh, it seems like it's been a long time since. Uh, gosh, I remember uh, back when the uh, coof was going on. Uh, we were just so dry, and now Hollywood is releasing movies left and right. Some good, a lot of mediocre, and a lot that are atrocious. But we're not alone. We're joined by the lovely Six. How are you, Six? I'm doing great. I'm so excited that you're on the panel and. Uh, looking forward to a wonderful show. We've got a great, great show planned. Well, I'm going to try to be professional, even though you're right next to me today. Yeah, I'm, gonna I'm not going to be professional. Uh-oh. Just FYI. And, of course, the great <laughs> Culture Casino. How are you, sir? Oh, fantastic. It's been a lovely morning so far, and uh, I have, I'm have anticipating a lovely day and a nice entry into the weekend, so I'm stoked. And, of course, the newest YouTuber amongst YouTubers at the 100K and Platinum level, the grand champion, the heavyweight, the man who takes no prisoners and takes down all of the competition, one video at a time. He <laughs> is the Canadian heavyweight, Chado. <laughs> I need a, a Lucha Libra mask now. Yeah, and we, we got to oil you up so you're nice and sizzle hot. Do we, I, need to get, I need to get my own design. I'm, I might I think work you need that. to go shirtless and get a tattoo of that Chato <laughs> logo you have and just be all oiled up. It, it will only be one of those rub on tattoos. Like I can't, I can't deal with anything else other than that. So I'll help you yes, thank on. you for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. And of course you're not the only Canadian. We have the Canadian amongst Canadians, the great doctor of scripts. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get some sun <laughs> while I'm indoors with you all to, today, but I'm happy to, to be here. Uh, some cool things to, to talk about, that's for sure. Awesome. Chato, I can hear every bite you're taking with those earbuds. <laughs> I can hear his jaw clicking. I can hear your jaw clicking, and I think you're having corn nuts with ketchup. Is that what? Or maple syrup and corn nuts. No? Okay. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, watch Paul Chato as he puts uh acid in his eyeballs let's see if they survive medical mornings with paul chetto well we, we're not alone Andre. We've got a, we've got a that's bunch. that's my uh, second drop i've got to do i'm going in for cataract surgery on monday so i'm oh fantastic so well we're not in alone in the chat and, and on and sorry <laughs> Chato, you're echoing. Yeah, yeah, you're you're echoing, and you're okay. Yeah, we got to mute him. Uh, we're not alone, and we've already had some super chats come in. We have indeed. Uh, Final Smash sixteen eighty nine says for five dollars, like just a pre starter to our main topic. Where he says, "How does I get to justify letting KK make this Ray movie?" He has to know this will only push fans further away. Will he prevent this from happening? And this, of course, is uh, in reference to our main story, which is about uh, the story synopsis that has been leaked uh, surrounding the upcoming Ray movie. And it really doubles down on the force is female. We will, uh, we will get into that. So just hold that thought, for we will get to it. Uh, Lord Trinan also says uh, for $10 on that topic, given the many humiliations KK has suffered lately, I doubt she will be around to continue her fake Ray movie plans. Her minions are leaking this to trick people into thinking otherwise. Ignore it. Yeah, well, we shall see. 
we shall see exactly what goes on with that. The Waltman 4 says BlackRock. New police, everyone. Keep your mouth shut about what you do in the, in the company, even if it's trying to get the girls. Yeah, this, of course, is... Um, is in uh, relation to the O'Keefe Foundation, that uh, where James O'Keefe did his uh, usual, uh, usual brand of actual reporting by setting up like this phony date between a hot chick and um, a BlackRock recruiter. If you haven't seen this on Twitter, I highly recommend that you uh, that you do so, because even if this recruiter wasn't in a position to have power over what BlackRock does. He is in a position to know what they do as a general thing. And, and he had no chemistry with that woman. <laughs> no, I don't think that that dude has chemistry with anyone. Because that would be the wrench into does. O'Keefe's plan is like, you know, he sends the hot chick on the date with the guy and the guy ends up being like a really cool dude who doesn't give any information and she keeps wanting to date him again. <laughs> I, you have to, to wonder how story. many times that has happened. That that is Mexican Iron Man could make a cottage industry of uh, of uh, how to resist and not resist hot women. So yeah. so basically, if if O'Keefe ever decides to do like a, a midnight sedge expose, he should go after Mexican Iron Man first. Andre, I, I I'm can, never talking. They I, I can. <laughs> they, they can't crack me. You you can send me the hottest. No, but uh, that's what I meant. Like send the hot chicks to Mike. Yes, I, I, I can. I can do a video on how to guarantee hot chicks who won't be interested in you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a uh, that is a, that, that was is that a, was a good one. That is a, a start, yeah. And the Waltman Four also says for nine dollars ninety nine, we also got an update on the indie video game that uh, but Be but Be Betesta is that how you say it is working on from the FTC versus Microsoft trial of all places. The game is officially an Xbox slash PC exclusive due to the micro Bethesda purchase. Uh, yeah, that's a game I will not be playing on account of it not being on the Mega Drive. And also, have you have to wonder how popular is the, this game going to be in light of what is about to be done to... Um, uh, to Indiana Jones. Uh, and then jumping uh, uh, forward or into the main topics here, Callum Lyle says for $5, I saw Mahler's Secret Invasion review. Marvel is dead. Seriously dead. Everything is Fury's fault. Men bad. Blah, blah, blah. OP women, you get the idea. Right, let's put a pin in the rest of the Super Chats and get into it, because I have seen the first episode of Secret Invasion, so you don't have to. And uh, Script Doctor, you also saw the first episode of Secret Invasion, so you don't have to. I don't think that anyone else on the panel uh, saw Secret Invasion, and that's fine. The whole point is that we watch it, so you don't have to. Script what did you think? Oh, you saw it too. Oh, yeah, of course, Mr. Paul, you saw it. Let's uh, let's begin with you. I was thinking of Strange New Worlds here. You saw the first episode of Secret Invasion. Let us know how impressed you were with it. Wow. Um, it had parts. People spoke. Things blew up the end. <laughs> that was... Uh... That was tremendously um, enlightening. I'm glad <laughs> yeah, to have you on of course, I can't, uh, I can't disagree with any of that. It had parts. People did speak in it. Stuff did blow up. So my, but, uh, but my, my, through my main... those stuff, was it engaging in any way? No, no. That's that's really the issue. Is that um, I will say in its uh, defense, it's one of the first Marvel, uh, Disney, Star Warsy things which kind of made sense, except for the crazy exposition uh, trying to explain uh, some strange logic jumps. I mean, uh, again, no nobody believes in subtext. Everyone has to tell you everything all the time. Uh, that's just bad writing. Uh, I, I think I was more just exhausted from the the Star Wars, uh, sorry, the superhero 
uh, genre thing. It's like, it, it seems that that's weighing down on me more than anything else. It was not an incompetent production. That's probably the nicest thing I can say. It was just boring, tedious, and there were no surprises. There was nothing in there um, that uh, made it engaging. And one of the, the keys to writing is that as a writer, you want to surprise yourself because, ah, sorry, um, because then it surprises the audience, right? So there was none of that in there. And, and also, I'm afraid I just don't care for the drama that's unfolding the scrolls versus the scrolls and the fact that fury could not uh, find a condominium for them in you know in the time that he was on his secret spaceship i mean you know condo fees i understand they're expensive but you know those scrolls they could have had something nice in san diego yeah and I and, was, and uh, so that was it it's just boring i was about to ask you just that because the now that I've seen the first movie, the homework, sorry, the first episode, the homework that you had to see before seeing this series mm. was Captain Marvel the movie. Yes. And it and it was also the Spider-Man uh, Far From Home post credit sequence. And I believe one more post credit sequence, but I don't recall which one. Those were the homework that were necessary going mm -hmm. into this. Have you seen that homework? Yeah. And okay, so yeah, so you like were like clear on the story and everything. Now imagine for a second that you haven't seen Captain Marvel. You're just going straight into the movie this way or straight into the episode this way. Do you think it would was like in any way welcoming to new audiences that don't know everything in the mcu it explained things i think too much and and even if you're a, a new audience to something part of good writing is to just assume the audience knows and let 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 them figure it out on their own spooning it out dishing it out so didactically it, it just makes it tedious and and oh my god yeah i mean the the uh what's her name from Game of Thrones, and is she good, is she bad? I knew your mother. Like, the, the main thing was I don't care about the internal drama in it. Yeah. I, I feel nothing. Script Who doctor, yeah. did, did the first episode make you feel something? Um, it surprised me that it, it followed a coherent plot. Yes. But it was, it was heavily expositional. It was trying to be like a Manchurian candidate type of thing. Mm. Um, the elements were in there for drama, but again, the dialogue was just so poor and so on the nose that I didn't care. I mean, you had um, Ben Ben Mendelsohn, is that his name? I, I can't remember. The, the, the good, the good yes, scroll. yes, that's his name. Um, he, he was trying to work here, work on this thing. He was trying to uh, empathize uh, or sorry, he's trying to re like reconnect with his daughter who's gone missing, who ends up being Amelia Clark. I'm not spoiling anything. It was clear as day. <laughs> In instant you see her. Um, that That's a father's daughter relationship issue. Um, all the stuff around Nick Fury was just boring. Like, really boring. It was, it was like a first draft for someone who had just seen a couple of spy movies and said, I can do that. As opposed oh to don't American. oh don't go for a walk in the middle of Moscow at night, Nick. Something uh, something's going to bad going to happen. You're, oh you're no, because you're a black man in Moscow. Black man, Russia. which is not such a big deal anymore. It's not like uh, uh, Nor Morris uh, in uh, the Mission Impossible's of the seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrett, not Garrett Morris. Anyway, so yeah, it was dumb. And then what happened? He got kidnapped by a evil british woman who cackled by mi6 she spoke. <laughs> yeah dear MI6. lord so um, good to see you nick i was hoping that it would be under better circumstances <laughs> yeah oh and then here's the other part too like he puts in a spy camera and it, it does a visual and audio recording of everything in the room and it's so great that it picks up the two people talking, and it's so what uh, lucky of her that she actually dishes out the name of the person they're looking for, as opposed to just handing over a document and not revealing the name and just letting them, you know, read it 
because that's usually how spies work in the event that they might be bugged. They don't do any audio giveaway or oral giveaway. Um, it, it's it was really it was really first time late, like high school or first year college level writing uh, exposition around a plot that with some better dialogue and more intrigue could have actually worked because the, the whole plot was we have this is going to happen at some point and the end end of the episode that thing happens and you're like oh you lived up to your promise that is step one but you didn't make the promise very interesting or rewarding as a result no that's the issue uh, i i almost dozed off several times <laughs> watching it. In the and it's not like I was watching it late or something. No, it was in the middle of the day, and I tried to pay attention to it, but I almost found like my mind wandering and drifting because it just couldn't keep my attention. Plus, I was annoyed by it because you know what I hate with this series, and I'm sure it's going to do that. That is, whenever you have like a, a change in personnel behind the scenes, and you get these assholes that get like the brilliant idea that instead of just moving forward we're going to go backwards and we are going to reframe this and we are going to make some shocking revelations that are really awkward because they don't fit because they weren't there because we literally just pulled them out of our ass like for instance uh, I do love the Battlestar Galactica reboot series. The one exception to that is some of the li later Cylon revelations, when it was really obvious that this wasn't something that was there. It was never set up. It was some idiot that had the idea, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? And then they just, they, they just installed it and it didn't work. It just fell flat on its face, ruined the narrative and everything. Another example is in the recent uh, Captain America comics, where they came with this shocking revelation. <gasps> Captain America was a Yahtzee all along. And they're obviously going to do something like that. They're going to have like this established adventure, that established this or that. Something was always a scroll. And I think that is some, so obviously ridiculous because it is so tacked on towards the end and there is no way they're not going to do it and just for that i'm like i'm against again against this series to begin with it has to win me over and the first episode failed miserably in doing so and uh, greetings tom who's, uh, who's also joined us now uh, i take it Yo. you did not see the first episode of uh, secret invasion i turned my tv on I went to watch Secret Invasion, and I watched Batman and Robin instead. <laughs> wow. That wow, would have been a better choice. Yes. yes. As bad as it was, that's a better choice. Did, did you warm up to George Clooney as Batman? Yes. I well, spent the better part of last night on meat explaining why that movie is a much better film than I thought it was. Yeah. Wait a minute. I thought, well, okay, I'm sorry. I'm not going to derail us, but I could have sworn last year you said you hated it, but okay. I hadn't seen it in a decade. Yeah. So he And then I also the, saw the Batman. He hated, oh, yeah. And uh, let me guess, you your appreciation for Batman and Robin uh, increased even more after actually watching it with the Batman fresh in mind. Kind of, sort of. I mean, it's been a year, what, and a half since I've seen the Batman, but. At the same time, I just, I appreciated it more this time. I watched it with different eyes. And, uh, I don't know, I had fun with it. Sure, it's flawed as fuck. But it went from like a 4 out of 10 to a 6 out of 10 in my book. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. But, and, and better than Secret Invasion. I yeah. think part of the problem, too, is that you've got the weight of a... Uh, a, 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 an alien race that can change shape so the writers can do whatever they want whenever they need there is no no problem that can't be solved with them suddenly imitating someone else like when the main guy uh, became Nick Fury and, and shot um, what's her name Maria Hill oops spoilers <laughs> oops uh, yeah, so, I mean, that kind of stuff is just horrendous. If a writer 
uh, uh, you know, isn't uh, writing themselves into a corner and then then writing themselves out of it and, and seeing and letting the audience join them in that journey, then it's just no fun. And there's there's no corners that they will find in this because, oh, it's a scroll pretending to be a mother. Oh, it's a scroll pretending to be, you know, a, a culture casino. Wait a second. Hold on. Are, is culture a scroll? I don't think so. I mean, the scrolls, they can replicate many things, but they cannot replicate a <laughs> glorious uh, set of uh, beard and hair like that. Yeah, so, you're right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, your, your descriptions are not encouraging me to watch this show. So thank no, you for wa waving me off. I appreciate not it. Not worth it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but before we uh, move on to the main topic, we had uh, another new episode drop in the last couple of days here. Now, uh, Mr. Chato, you, of course, you were excused because, uh, as everyone can see, you are in a slightly different uh, different uh, location than usual, and you can't prioritize watching drivel that no one can take any enjoyment from. But again, me and script... We are not so lucky because uh, we have both seen the most recent episode of Star Trek Strange New World. And this is the episode where Una is being put on trial for the crime of being a Lydian. Because the Federation is still spooked about uh, augments and any kind of like augmentation of natural abilities because of the whole calm and eugenics wars and everything like that so basically this new episode was kind of like a, a new version of the episode of the one where data was being put on trial that's kind of like what i got from it only much more ineptly managed script what did you think about this episode uh hollow and superficial uh, has a complete misunderstanding of the prime directive, which I, which is also kind of similar to what happened with the Berman era. They didn't quite get it correct either here and there they did, but most of the time they didn't. Um, there's this big argument that, uh, Una just wants to be herself yet. You cannot specifically identify what would change with this new information being revealed. And, and that's the key problem here is that there's, it's not, it's not, there's nothing to show an example that she was ever living a secret and it was impeding her abilities. And there's nothing as a result of this trial that would allow her to be more open about anything because who she is, is far more important than the fact that she was genetically modified and the genetic modifications uh, that they have in the society really doesn't make much sense because the premise is that they constantly are genetically modifying their children with each generation. We don't know why. We don't know what sort of modifications they are doing. And apparently if they don't do this, they would just be born normal humans. So it's a really perplexing type of uh, set of parameters that they laid out in, in this world that just doesn't make much sense to me because it feels like you genetically modify the mother and the father whatever children they have should have those same c combinations of genetic modifications if they're in sync or, or not. So and I have a question. Yes. I have a question. Uh, now in the future that mm -hmm. Star Trek exists in the idea that there wouldn't be genetically modified humans is ridiculous. Well, that's the so, whole point. There are, but they're made illegal because they're freaked out over the eugenics wars which resulted in Khan of Wrath of Khan. Yeah, and the genetic... Then, then, why, then, why, isn't, then why isn't La on, uh, on trial also? She should be, yes. like that's Well, the other part, too, is that it's not so much... It's basically genetic modifications to do to um, not solve a problem is what's technically illegal. Uh, so, like, if a child is, born, is going to be born with, like, spina bifida, they would correct that. But, ah. It's basically just it's just it's basically to a deterrent for creating a superior race as opposed to fixing an abnormality. And that's that that's where the differential differential comes. And in regards to the case of like Jordy LaForge, apparently for his condition, the technology to cure blindness on a genetic level was not 
um, at the at the level it needed to be when he was born, and that didn't come until much much later. But it, again, for him, he has just bionic eyes. Um, but that that's kind of where they're saying is that if you, it's basically um, restricting the abuse of, of augmentation to create a superior race as opposed to correcting something that is outside of the norm, like being so, born so with. If it, so if Una uh, got uh, augmented to win spelling bees, that would be bad. Yeah, or augmented to be a super, super athletic, super strength, those types of things. Gotcha. That'd be bad because that would be, that's against the what the Federation would deem the natural evolution of, it's like artificial evolution. That's what they're technically against for. And that's what the laws are in there for as well, because the eugenics wars was artificial uh, evolution. And the people that were artificially evolved abused their power to try and take over the world. Gotcha. And that is the fundamentals of what the law is. But they in this episode and in subsequent other Star Trek stories are trying to um, not not so many. They kind of went back and forth with Julian Bashir uh, in Deep Space Nine. But it's a little tricky there. But basically what they're trying to say is that because Una it, it is uh, they're trying to do an allegory with regards to who they are really on the inside and that the genetic modification is to reinforce that. And it's thank it's you. <laughs> I this is what I want to know, because. I'm a stickler for subtext and the messaging and the hidden layers in movies. And that's why I love Kubrick. That's why I like this movie by Wes Anderson. I'm not familiar with Wes Anderson. I'm going to take a deep dive and get into his work right now. But I absolutely loved Asteroid City for that reason. There was so much to, so much to, to unpack and unravel. And sometimes my affinity for doing that leaves me stumped because I'm looking for messages and subtext that sometimes isn't there. And this is the thing that uh, that kind of like stumped me with this episode. What the hell kind of message are the writers trying to send here? Why stop the entire series dead in its track to do like a whole court trial featuring on the eugenic side of the Alliance. I mean, World War II is quite a far ways away. We don't really have any pressing concerns about eugenics or anything like is that. Is it more so that they want to just do a uh, trial episode a la like TNG and whatnot? They want to have that impact. They're definitely yeah. trying to make this as impactful as a measure of the man or like court martial in the original series. But the other problem yeah, is that I mean. they don't understand the source of where they're coming from for Illyrians, because apparently Illyrians aren't just genetically modified humans. They also have some sort of type of religious aspect to them as well that is never explored. And it's like, I don't under, I just don't get I just don't get the perspective of that. I don't understand where this is all coming from, why a human for all intents and purposes that comes from human culture and and lives pretty much just like humans and wants to inter integrate with humans where does the religious aspect come into or where like, you know, the traditions, the practices, what have you, if it's all centered around genetic modification, it's basically, it's basically doing, uh, 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 perverting the, the very concept that's used with, um, Michael Crichton's work with regards to Westworld and regards to Jurassic park. It's you're playing with things that you may think you know about, but you don't actually understand what the real consequences are. And that was the whole theme with regards to the eugenics wars and the star trek history is that they felt oh we can do all these amazing things but should we and it ended up le nearly leading to their destruction to the species destruction that's why it was outlawed it's basically saying like oh pulling in the reins there's uh, and in some cases in some interpretations they go to the extreme to the point where you can't even look at genetic code uh in the berman era at least to, as, according to enterprise and in other parts, it's basically like, no, it's just careful study. And it's not supposed to be something that um, manipulates the potential of where a, a species is going to be evolving to because it evolves through natural mutation and and, nat and breeding and not um, specifically trying to say, oh, yeah, we're going to super boost the immune system. Well, if anyone's ever read I Am Legend, <laughs> like one part of that is, you know, well, we, re we superhuman boost the immune system to the point where it mutated humanity. And now it's no, now what it is is no longer humanity, and that's the other part too is trying to preserve the the the, the evolutionary um, idea that that came with the, the species of Earth, or in the case of the Federation, the species of any any indigenous uh, species to their to their own planets. Um, 
and and the other part too it's like you're messing with with nature that is not it's a man-made messing of nature as opposed to a natural occurring event and that goes into the prime directive which is that um you you do not influence or change another culture uh from their natural progression however if you are a a starship in in the middle of space and you see an asteroid is heading towards a planet um you have you are with completely within your right to 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 move or alter or destroy that asteroid from hitting that planet so long as the people on that planet have no idea that you did it because the because you can argue that the asteroid heading to it is a beyond is not is an unnatural possible event to a degree because there's a society that is flourishing there and the right to life supersedes um the 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 nat- the natural aspects of a nature trying to kill all life that, that there is because that's what nature does but if you were to see a war on the planet you cannot get involved because that's an internal conflict that is between the so- societies themselves and that's where the prime directive kind of really says no you can't you can't change what they're doing and and unless you find a third party that is actually making that influence, you are prohibited from doing so. Espe- unless that third party itself is also a, a species that you've never encountered. Like it's a really complicated thing, but it's. I've just gone cross-eyed. But it does not. It, it does not um, allow. <laughs> it, it does not allow you to not help out a species if they are in need, or even if they call for help and are not pre-warp or anything of that nature. Um, in fact, they act, they literally say that Robert April violated the prime directive by giving Federation technology to a pre-warp species. I'm like, yes, that is definitely a violation. That is an egregious violation. And that's something that no captain would do. But he argues it's to save lives. But we also don't know what the rest of the context is because you don't need to give them, you don't need to give a species technology in order to save lives. Sometimes you can just solve the problem. So it's, 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 yeah, it's a whole mess. I, I, it's, Whew, it's 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 something that I've been trying to kind of wrap my head around because as I tweeted the other day, I really don't know where to begin when it comes to this episode or the previous episode and all the things that they got wrong regarding the philosophy of the of the franchise and what they got wrong just as a on a story level. Yeah, on the story level because that's like what I was stumped at. Like, what story are they really trying to tell her and tell here that relates to us? Like the Star Trek everything aside, that's kind of like what had me stumped a little bit and where I may have like been looking for things that weren't necessarily there. But you would agree that the writers then evidently did not do an amazing job. No, I mean, I don't even think they even kind of understand like the Truman Doctrine from back in the day, <laughs> you know, the uh, and, and any idea with regards to influencing another culture. It, it's basically you're supposed to just stay mind your own business when it comes to socio-political um behaviors of other of other species or other cultures yeah well i think that's about all we can figure out of uh, of this episode for now so we'll uh, get back to it next week when mr chato has uh, has caught up as well well I'll, then... I'll be i'll be i'll be able to talk about this one next week for sure uh, but yeah. one one thing i wanted to ask the two of you is that um i i made the uh the um uh, the observation in my first episode of this season that one could look at this as not being our Trek anymore. And if someone is brand new to Trek and young, would this have been an engaging episode? Like ignore the fact, ignore the rules, ignore the canon. Uh, I, I'm assuming now that this is no longer our Trek and we need to stop treating it that way. What I mean, it, it was, it well, was, then how about it, they it, stop it, calling it Star Trek? I mean, that's the other part too, right? Like ah. that, that's the conflict. They, they use the brand, but they're, and they're trying to say it's our Trek, but it most clearly definitely isn't. And then on just a writing aspect, it's not very good, but I would assume maybe an eight year old that hasn't seen much might be engaged by it a hundred percent. And, uh, and I, I think a teenager would put it on the background while they're tweeting or TikToking or what have you. Um, and I, I think that's a big problem because if you well, can't this, hook, hook the, the Star Trek, the Star Trek brand thing, I don't think is relevant because a network executive will do whatever it takes to to get eyeballs to a show. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 TV series National Treasure was absolutely nothing like the movies, like zero. Yes, but they called it National Treasure. So I mean, that's just <laughs> you know, that's just Hollywood one hundred and one. 
And then they cancelled it. Uh, Correct. In terms of, uh, <laughs> of this series, though, uh, I think that Strange New World actually would be able to build uh, a brand new viewership because there's enough entertainment there for that. I don't know that this particular episode would win anyone over because it was okay. boring as crap. Yeah. And yeah. there were no stakes in it to make it interesting enough to watch. Well, it, it was Pike maybe going on trial as well for conspiracy. Yeah, that's the other part, too. They have this whole angle with requesting asylum. But my understanding with regards to at least current era asylum laws, which they're using as their their fundamental as their foundation, is that uh, you still have to make a, a verbal or a written request. You can't just intimate it through action. I think that was completely freaking ridiculous. Also, yeah. it was like, OK, uh, grant asylum. Fine. You are in the Federation space. You kind of like have the firm, the, the there's a difference between being granted asylum and being granted a career in Starfleet. Those are two very different things. So why why didn't they just dump Una in Martha's Vineyard? <laughs> I, I don't she know. wasn't Mexican. Oh, damn, you're right. No, but she apparently was. you have Rebecca <laughs> Romain playing a half Asian woman and nobody's upset about that. Yeah. Well, she's Illyrian. <laughs> There oh, I thought go. you meant alluring. That's two different, very different things. Yeah. But uh, okay, let's great uh, review. Let's, uh, let's get into the super chat. Uh, yeah, exactly. Let's get into a this one's uh, related to uh, secret invasion. Doctor Longdongler said, "Which did the secret alien invasion better, Captain Scarlet or the Invaders or Marvel's Secret Invasion?" Other you choose. Wow, uh, Captain Scarlet did not last very long but no. was fun. Uh, I mean, it's goofy, goofy shit. Uh, the invaders I loved, the Roy Thinnis invaders was uh, fantastic, but you could tell who the invaders were because their pinkies stuck out. Yeah. And the, the, the ones who took on black characters did not have lighter palms, that their entire hand was black. That was the other way they could tell. Uh, that that I, I enjoyed the invaders way more than Secret Invasion. And they were shapeshifters, actually. I mean, to tell you the truth, they were scrolls, but they they didn't have good invaders. They had humans who decided that they were going to join the invaders on their uh, mission to take over the planet. So that was fun because then humans were fighting other humans yeah. for uh, capitulating. Well, yeah, they were collaborators, just kind of like how V had their collaborators as well. Yeah. Yep. I know. Good question. Yeah. And I will also say, yeah, V did it best. And uh, moving on, Maverick Christian says for $10, did it make sense that these space fetting scrolls with tech centuries beyond humans couldn't find a home themselves? <laughs> and wasn't Captain Marvel supposed to find the scrolls a new home? Yeah. Yeah, well, both I guess, of them. but uh, she she evidently she wasn't that good, was she? Well, I mean, she's she never traveled to space before. Uh, I guess uh, I don't know. It, it's such a it's such a mind boggling movie because she she was with the uh, the Kree for like a couple of years or something of that nature, but only doing Kree missions. And I don't I don't get it. It's a whole gobbledy group. They they really I mean they dropped the ball a lot with Captain Marvel and then on top of this the secret invasion what was really kind of fascinating about it is the reveal that some of the Avengers were replaced and he didn't know which ones they were until it was too late. Yeah, to me too that's late. the that's the stupid thing that's going to ruin the whole series. Yep, and the MCU. Yeah, you're just sitting there watching the scene and you're going, okay, is he a scroll or not? Oh, he was. Like it's terrible. And Mr. Tickle Drunk says for two Canadian dollars, check culture casinos weave. Scrolls can't copy <laughs> accessories. Oh. Yeah. Oh, there's the ticket. Master of Trek sends in 14 South African Rands and says Robert Meyer Burnett wrecked Kurtzman Trek's argument to remain today. I didn't see it. Did he like post something or did he do a video? Maybe he uh, did a video. I, know say, I think, uh, actually, I think I know who this is. And, yeah, he released a video. Uh, yeah, I think they sent me the video this morning. I saw morning. it this morning. I, that's yeah. the state of modern Star Trek, right? Yeah, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. It's on my queue. 
I, I haven't, I haven't too. yeah, I haven't seen it either. I mean, I noticed in the first episode of season two is that they were moving it more towards disco. Yeah. And then uh, let's see here. We've got, uh, I believe this has to do with one of the shows you talked about. John Thomas says, if you want a good exploration of the idea of genetic, genetic modification enhanced, read David Weber's Honor Harrington series. Mm, don't know it. Oh, I'm not, not really yeah. familiar with that one either, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that, John. And then we got 200 Watt Studios says, uh, was there a, a scene where Lan uh, testified to Una, on Una's behalf talking about coming from a background of genetic modification? There was some reference to that. Yes. It was very, it was very poorly done. Extremely. It in was fact, like it, building. To, it was kind of like, we'll get back to this in a later episode. It literally, like any good defense lawyer worth, worth their salt would say, um, why does this person who is related to a, a genocidal madman who's gen genetically augmented uh, not was not scrutinized with regards to um, her entry into Starfleet? And if they revealed, well, she requested asylum, it's like, well, you just ended your show, right? <laughs> like, right like the entire episode right then and there. And I think they knew that. It, it was a really terrible way to try and figure that out. And ugh, it's very bad. And then Miguel Farah sends in, I believe that's Chilean, Chilean pesos, uh, says modern day writers would make James Vincent an invader all along. And then they'd wonder why everyone scoffs at them for their incompetence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. Um, let's see here. And just trying to get all the ones that have to do with the, the topic we're on. Did you guys talk about no hard feelings yet? No, not yet. We have not yet spoken about it. Culture is the I know Culture has seen it, so and uh, yeah. Eduardo Ciboli says, uh, No Hard Feelings was awesome. Good old raunchy comedy filled with full frontal nudity. Very funny. So what did you think? You know, it, he's 100% he's, he's correct. There is full frontal nudity. Um, it's in a very strange context because it's, um, it's not in an adult activity context. In, instead, it's in a fight sequence. Uh, which is interesting. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, there were uh, parts of the film that were uh, very funny that I did laugh out loud. A lot of the audience did. Um, I'm actually surprised that this film didn't do better initially with their previews, but as compared to their budget, the 2.15 million that they made in previews wasn't terrible. Uh, but the film, the film overall, I think was uneven. And I would say that there was a wonderful idea there. And if somebody like script doctor, uh, had gotten a hold of it for another couple of passes through it, I think it would have been a much better film. Um, it's, it's not even quite, it's, it's average for the, the now, you know, current year, uh, as far as, you know, a five out of 10 score, but it's, it's not, um, it doesn't hold together there, there. It's got a great idea. There's like the first 10 to 15 minutes are a total waste and really, you know, kind of you doubt whether or not you want to remain in the theater. And then the last few minutes don't, don't wrap up the film. So it's about two thirds. Good. One third, not so much. All right. I have a question for you then. Yeah. All right. Without any spoilers. Yeah. Let's say a certain person is going on a date Saturday night. Now, is this the movie that I take her to before or <clears throat> that my friend would take her to before going to the bar for drinks or after a couple of drinks have been had? Oh, you're going to need some lubrication for that movie. Okay, thanks. That's all I need. Yeah. yeah. Asking for a friend. Sure, sure. Yep. A yeah. friend who likes to hang from window panes. So, yeah. There what? you go. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did it, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All right, let's do the next. Let's go. Uh, Dark King for two dollars. Is that Australian? So the force is female, yes. but then what is a woman, Andre? We can't tell you. We can't define that. No. Um, well, we we could, but we'd be canceled by YouTube exactly. instantly afterwards. Right. We could we could rattle off some like medical speak, but you know, like that's outdated now. A and, penin uh, penis don't list, believe in that. Uh, possible womb the, having in the people need to know, Tom. For five dollars Australian, Callum Lyle, since the Fortress female doesn't have a time of the month. We yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You remember when Palpatine said, let the force flow through you. Oh, boy. Oh, God. Ba boom bam. Whoa. <laughs> he says, Man. let the hate flow through you. Oh, yeah, that's right. The hate flow through you. 
Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they, the, the force can be it's heavy that time flows. Of the month when the force hates you. Yes. Be, <laughs> the force flows. can be a heavy flow or a light flow. The hate. The hate. Uh, Don't Longo. plug the floor. The force. Yeah. <laughs> Don't plug <Yeah>. the force. <laughs> That's Dr. Right. Longdongler sends a thumbs up. I'm willing to bet. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Longdongler. And if you haven't hit that thumbs up yet, please do. Uh, and then we've got uh, Miguel Farah who says, the force is female. La Fuerza, not El Fuerzo. Did I say that right, Mikey? La Fuerza. Too, but El Fuerzo. La Fuerza. Say, Tom. La Fuerza. Fuer. Fuer. Sa. Sa. Put it together. La Fuerza. fuerza. Good. Your your R rolling is terrible. Well, Probably he's I'll from there. La, Wisconsin. La Fuerza. Ruffles uh, have ridges. Ridges. Uh, Str Redwall says Mexican Iron Man cold piloting a stream proves he's a YouTuber. He's still not a YouTuber though. Important distinction there. Try the rabbit chicken tacos. That's right. They're all <laughs> natural, and they come from uh, Mikey's house. Yep. Yeah. See. Yep, them butts are good for licking and chomping. Yeah, they got four wings and six legs. It's like God made them for eating. <laughs> if you think about it. All right, we got some more Super Chats here, and then we'll get on to the Star Wars news, because there's some Star Wars talk, it looks like. Oh, boy. Uh, what's your first thought? Send, uh, send us a Super Sticker. Let me see if I can see what it is here. It's a I'm thumbs sure. up. It's a thumbs up. Thank you so much, Six. I'm sure you shared it in the private chat there, but we didn't even have to go for it. Uh, Ruby Jade sends us a super sticker. Uh, was this the one that said... Uh, it's a Shiba dog, Shiba dog in his hands. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say so it was a Shiba dog. Yep. Yeah. Tipping Barnes says, Tom, you sound spicier than usual. New haircut. Yes. I had it dyed as well. Yes, I had it I thought you had a groinal wax. Just kidding. Moving That's on. a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's modeling for a bowling ball. Yes, I'm bowling for soup. Hypergyver 2 says, Gotta give the Titanic credit. It managed to successfully maintain its flawless kill streak by disconnecting its competition's controller. Ouch. <laughs> too soon. Oh, we? yeah, too soon. Yeah. Uh, but it's. Um... It is worth it is worth uh, discussing though because it is a topic that has dominated the news cycle all week when there really was no need for it to dominate beyond Sunday. But uh, hey, well, I'm sure it was oh, there, no, there was to, there's, uh, there's a threat made to a Chinese investor to pay them and their dad. <laughs> well, I was going to yeah. say there was other news going on, Hunter, that they needed to cover up for too. Uh, like exactly, that. that's kind of like what I'm thinking because. Um, because, yeah, for those that have been under a rock, the legacy of the Titanic, and this is legacy that truly reverberates through history. I mean, if there was something that was, like, written in the star, like a canon event that's true across the multiverse, it has to be the sinking of the Titanic. I mean, you even had a book writing about the sinking of the Titanic, Years before it actually happened, only in the book, it wasn't called the Titanic, it was called the Titan. Ironically, the same thing as the submersible uh, that, uh, that went down with five people, including the CEO of the company, last Sunday for like an adventurous little trip down to the wreckage of the Titanic. And this was uh, a truly remarkable i think we can say that a little submersible made for five people not for five people to be comfortable in but for five people to be crammed into and it was controlled by by a, a third party playstation controller That's it was all digital very, there's no manual controls um, very confident no inspiring. analog stuff yeah or yeah no gps tracking or anything well, like that well I mean, they use starlink like they used all off the counter tracking technology that they could over the counter tracking technology that they could um they had been on a number of voyages uh many of them successful some of them with some incidences that had to have been addressed which uh we'll probably get more details of that later but um, yeah, uh, there were, there was a lot of um, a lot of questionable practices going on. Yeah. 
Well, absolutely. I, I think we've hit rock bottom with all the jokes, though. I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. That was, that was too much. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's... Yeah. Uh... But yeah, and also it's worth noting that uh, the CEO of the company, he felt it was very important to be inspirational, meaning he didn't want any 50-year-old experienced dudes with, you know, like actual submarine experience because they weren't inspirational. That's the bigger problem. It was problem, far right? better well, with, yeah. like, so various diversity to... hires. Well, no, no, that has to do more with him because he was one of the youngest fire, fighter pilots ever. Uh, he, he was 19 flying stuff that most people had to take eight to ten years to learn how to do. He wanted more people like him when he was younger involved. He, he used the diversity angle to also justify that socially, but this is a young man who was kind of a savant with a lot of things and made a great fortune. You could kind of compare him that if he wasn't um, allegedly cutting quarters, he would have been like the, the dad of um, International Rescue, like Dad Tracy, to, to the Thunderbirds, essentially, because <laughs> that's kind of what he was trying to become. It look, it looks like when you take a look at his history. Cameron, Cameron just killed him in a oh, in Cameron, an ABC yeah, maybe, interview. Just, oh yeah, like he just actually completely. never really spoke to him, but he did talk about like yeah. how the methods that he was using uh, were were not sustainable for for repeated uh, ex, uh, exploration of the of the of the ocean floor. And yeah. and uh, Cameron went down according to him 30 times yeah yeah and obviously yeah. back <laughs> and he, well, he was the first more time there than the than the captain of the actual titanic but yes carry on tom no i was just gonna say and he even said that like he was talking about how it's like if this the, the way it probably happened it was instantaneous and he said he knew it right away too yeah yeah um so and that was the thing with like the tracking and the communication things that's what a lot of people were asking from the start it was like if you lost can if you lost contact with them right away and you can't find them, then chances are they aren't there anymore, right? Like something happened, they're gone. They're well, uh, ocean deep ocean diving is more treacherous than going into space, absolutely. And that's kind of what you know Cameron was saying too. You know, it was like it's a very dangerous game to be playing, yeah. and no, no backup device, uh, remote backup device that can dive down and and ferret you would things out. If think. Something. There's nope. just so many things wrong with this. Yeah. This is uh, the point that Cameron uh, and when, you can and think they would have like a drone. James Cameron. Cameron. Sorry, just yeah, James Cameron. Cameron. Sorry, yeah. yeah. But you would because think they would have like a drone, Andre, or something that follows them. Yeah, sorry. Well, there, there's this currently this that, day uh, is no technology that can, uh, no type of probe that could go down and pull something that has sunk up uh, yeah. from that depth. Well, I'm not even talking about water pressure. I'm not even talking about that so much. It's just like a little camera driven pro drone that follows along just to make sure that everything's going kosher even if it's a uh, delayed send back you know and this is the point that uh, that uh, james cameron was making too for all their dives down to the titanic they never went alone it was always two submersibles just in case one would suddenly get itself tangled into something right the other one would be there to, to be able to help out in the way that uh, that was possible, uh, whereas this thing here went in completely completely un, uh, unsupported. So, yeah, like this is obviously like a high risk endeavor, and the dude he like the CEO. Uh, to be fair, he was very upfront about the risk. I mean, there's even video of of him telling anyone wanting to go that uh, by agreeing to this you risk all kinds of emotional trauma physical injury and even death yeah do i sign there's way so very upfront about that yep. yeah oh yeah i'm sure this is going to be one of those messy situations where um you know it's going to come down to that where like yeah you can't really sue him because you sign away all he these was waivers. very upfront about it and i honestly i have to say that because Legal mindset. He did a great video on this and uh, where how where they are liable and how there may be regulation. What I will say about that, I hope there will be no regulation about this. Some things you just can't regulate. You know what this is to me? This is the exact same thing as base jumping and parachuting and these kinds of extreme sports. Whenever you do extreme sports you take a risk. You take it yeah. knowing and willingly. And if you were to like institute new regulations every time 
a parachuter died or a base jumper died. When, spoilers, that happens all the freaking time. And we don't change things for, for, for that. So I would have uh, hoped that they won't do it here either. Just like see the see it what, what it was. Here you had some people with way too much money and way too big a fascination with the Titanic that decided that seeing the pictures ain't good enough. We have to physically be there. And they were willing to pay the price for it. And they knew right. fully, full well that going into this one custom-made death machine, if anything went wrong, they they'd be dead before they knew what hit them, which incidentally is exactly what happened. I mean, the risk well, was there. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I could probably describe exactly the, the horror. Yeah, I think everybody's with probably seen to, the like, videos. Yeah. The heat that would have uh, occurred due to the pressure. Um, the, um, unfortunately, there are there would most likely be no remains to. That's what everybody's been saying. And Cameron was saying, too, is like what James Cameron was saying as well. It's like once the implosion happened, they had no idea. It was pretty instantaneous. Luckily for them, nobody probably suffered at all. And like he was saying, is like there is no remains to be found. And so did some of the other specialists say the same things. And this is what I was going to compare it to. Dragon Bricks is right here. It's no different than the risk you take climbing like Mount Everest or exactly. any other things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And same thing with like also if you die on Mount Everest, like people that do climb Mount Everest, you'll see dead bodies all around. Yeah, I've seen some of the videos of some of the people who don't realize that shit, and it's <laughs> like. What do you think they do with the bodies, lady? It's like, <laughs> you think they're going to go up there and retrieve them? All, all I can say is try getting demonetized on YouTube if you want horror. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very different brand of horror. Oh, and you'll sorry. be alive to feel mm -hmm. that. Yeah, you, you think. That's, you know, metaphysically, no. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but let's move six, on yeah. from that. Oh, yeah. six, it was, it was pretty crazy. You. Yeah, six. I would like uh, uh, six if you if you're still there. What's uh, your thoughts on the uh, on the continued legacy of the Titanic now in the Titan? I I think that some of the jokes and the memes were a little bit in poor taste. I'm sure that the family members have seen some of those, and I I feel badly for them. I particularly feel badly for the 19 year old boy. I read an article that his aunt had said that he was very nervous about going on the trip and he was only going to please his father because it was on Father's Day weekend. And so I just, you know who, I hope that uh, yeah. they didn't suffer. You know who I feel the worst for there? The mother who lost both her husband and yes. her son in one go. That's the one individual I feel the worst for. Yeah. Yeah. Normally I'm not somebody who would poke any type of fun at death at all, but like, the other side of this, outside of the family thing, is I, I I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, you're you're sick or twisted or whatever. If you're going to do a joke about this, because like we've been just saying for the last ten minutes too, you take a risk doing this. Outside of that kid, who if it's true, he didn't really necessarily want to go on this. These people were paying a lot of money to do this thing. Yeah, it's that's... it's it's not like they're doing it. Out of, it's not like it was. You didn't know the risk going into it. Is kind of what I'm. Getting. They uh, were they... informed fully well that you are stepping into a potential death machine that's controlled by a freaking logitech controller yeah yeah i'm not taking shots at anyone who's who's been making the jokes i didn't i didn't mean it like that no no, no, no. i didn't think, think, think you were of, either but yeah i think that some of the jokes would have would have been a little bit different had these people not been rich well this is the again yeah that's exactly right and and there's an awful lot of people who've been making well, and it's not like they were remarks to... purely because they were rich. And I don't, the idea that you can't be human and rich at the same time right. uh, is, is a ridiculous thing. And that's notion. not where I'm coming from either. My point is, is like, it's, you do stupid things, you win stupid prizes sometimes. I hate saying yes, it like that, I but can. that's kind of where I'm coming from. It don't matter who you are, right? I'm not going to step in something like that. <laughs> like, no way. Uh, and, and again, I can't blame anybody for doing it but at the same time if it happens it happens it's not like it was a rescue mission or something like that it's not like this was a military you cameron, know or something like cameron that. said that in the history of of uh, diving in in a submersible all registered not a single registered vehicle has ever uh had a bad incident or a, a life-threatening incident no, and that's true. Been no, no, no loss of rigorous life. Rigorous testing, except for this Correct. particular one, that everyone Which did not. 
in the very, very small community, because this is a small community of like Titanic enthusiasts and stuff who wants that's to what Cameron was saying, yeah, yeah. And in this community of what 15 people, they were all freaked out about the Titan in particular because all the other stuff are like professional things, like stuff that actually work. You know, you get up again because they cost millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to make and they go through such rigorous testing and they have everything like those things are feats of engineering whereas this was something that was basically stitched together and cobbled together with spare parts in this dude's garden yeah not really not really i mean it just goes down to the the one thing with regards to any type of contractors you yeah. most people who are looking for the, these things to be constructed they go to the lowest bidder that can get the job done and right. that's that's an attitude that has to change in some regards because again when it comes to people's lives and safety like this is the hard lesson that nasa learned back in the early days when they True. were working with some of the contractors they went to the lowest bidder they found that there are certain design flaws and, and quality issues, and they had to realize, well, maybe we can't just always go with the lowest bidder. And then that caused a whole wave of issues with regards to how much money is NASA getting and maybe cutting the space program budget down. And it, it was it was nuts, and it was something that kept on getting cycled through with each generation. And that's why NASA doesn't do a whole lot of space exploration, um, yeah. as, like uh, extra orbital ex exploration, sorry. Yeah. Well, well this, uh, go ahead. Andre, was it you who said on Mr. H yesterday that in in reference to how the owner of the company he didn't want 50 year old white men running the thing or he didn't want to go to them and and somebody well, has said, yeah i i just yeah, I clarified that, that earlier yeah the, the yeah. guy when he got he got famous at 19 for being a jet fighter pilot and he wanted to be an astronaut and he wanted to do all these things and he managed to achieve a lot at a very young age he wanted people like him to be working on this he wanted young savant people like him he just managed to also use that to work within the current narrative socially of saying well we don't need 50 year old white men because when he was starting out he was 19 and the people that could fly as good as he could when he was starting out were 50 year old white men yeah right well, what i was referring that, uh... to was i thought somebody said and i thought it was andre said that that this man went to the 50 year old white men yes, and they all me. told him, was that you? Okay. Yeah, I thought that, uh, was, that was an excellent me. point. And that was true. the next point I was going to make that uh, he did actually go to 50 year old white man. And they all basically told him, I'm not stepping into that death machine. Yeah. So, uh, so there's another thing to add to that, that yeah, he may be looking for people like he was when he was young. Uh, it may fit into like the so, so current ideal political social narrative, but more importantly, I think he tr actually tried to go for mm -hmm. the experience, and the experience told him that you you can't put humans into this thing. Yeah. Well, it is a sad tragedy. Um, there's there's no getting around that, and uh, we'll see how it plays out here in the next. Uh, few weeks and months but uh on that note we got a couple super chats about it cryam sends in two and says tom fools and their money will sub depart yeah i guess so um canon faladero says uh sorry andre safety rules are written in blood yeah i mean i see a bunch they of people are talking about suing yeah. and stuff like that and they may actually have a case here because of certain negligence and other things they but in most have. cases you sign away those rights to sue if something happens yeah um and, uh, and, you know, if people were to sue the company, that's not my issue. My issue is I hope that there's not going to be any kind of uh, regulation of international you mean like, waters. Yeah, yeah. Because that is my point here. Some things you can't regulate. Same thing with people that do extreme sports. If you want to do that and you die in the, in the effort, then that was a risk that you made knowingly and willingly and the rest of us everyone else cannot be asked to, to pay the price I for think that like the, you can't have new rules every time a base jumper dies right no and i think i don't know if andrew covered this at all but i think a big point of this is basically yes you sign away certain things but that's with within reason right like if if in this instance it is partially still on the owners to make sure that safety regulations are up to snuff and that's going to be the big questions going forward the next few weeks were they actually doing the things that they're supposed to be doing 
to make sure that something like this wasn't supposed to, could it been prevented? That's going to be the bigger questions being asked in the next few weeks, I guess. And they're probably never going to have the answers, unfortunately, because they're never going to be able to salvage enough of it to really know that. Right. But we have video out there of them manually with a hand, like doing like the nuts and bolts and stuff on the outside of this thing. It's like, um, why are you not using uh, <laughs> a power tool or something like that? That just seems a little, uh, um, lack of daisy there like so there might be things like that that come out of this but at the end of the day it's it's kind of a gray area and every time even people have tried to sue when it comes to like even getting hurt on like you know uh when you go to the fair and get hurt on something it's really difficult in some cases unless it's you can prove some kind of negligence on somebody's part basically so that's the sad part about that truth anyway um let's see we got I was also wondering i was also yeah. wondering about what's the point of no return for that trip you know, is it once they tighten the final bolt or once they put it in the water? What if somebody says, no, I want to go back. I want to go back. You know, once you jump on an airplane. I think it's kind of the, the moment you decision. descend. I think it's kind of the same thing with like an airplane is like once that fucker is on the tarmac, you're done for. You can't get off until they're done. Yeah. I think it's the same kind of thing here. Once it's in the water and it starts doing its, you know, because it's like it depressurizes or whatever, isn't it, Andre, and how it goes down? It's well, like, I'm not an engineer with this, but I would Right, yeah, that's that, my problem is I don't understand any of this shit. But, but, yeah. but this I can say, that uh, I, I would say on this one, the point of no return is the moment that you are deep enough that the that the hull actually is at risk of, uh, that's of what I'm saying, yeah. catastrophic implosion. I would say that that is the kind of like the point of no return because before you reach that point, uh, then if there's some kind of leak, it's not going to be the whole thing imploding. It's going to be, oh, wow, here's a crack. Water is okay. pouring in. Yeah. We need to get the hell out of here yeah. right now. And this is basically by like every foot you submerge, it's that many more pounds of pressure exactly. that are being put on. You. Yes. And also, it's not that the it's not like uh, the moment that they decide to descend. There's no way to abort that. No, no, no. They can abort and go back they have, up again actually. every second. Okay. So it's a so it's a matter of at what point uh, is it so mm -hmm. that if something happens. You're going to face a do you recognize the problem or rather able than to. a leak? Yeah, that I would say that is the point of no return. And I think that's so, what they're saying with this is they didn't have any time to really react to anything if they did. No, because and, then you are past that point in the moment that, uh, like the thing that would be a leak before you reach that point, then you have like time to see, oh shit, here's some warnings going off. Oh, this thing is bulging. Oh, water is coming in. Abort, abort, let's go up. The moment that happens, when you are at the depth where catastrophic implosion happens, it's not going to be a leak. It's not going to be a warning. It's going to be whatever failed to create that kind of leak failing. And the moment that happens, the, the, uh, uh, the implosion is instantaneous, which right. means that there was very little pain because it would be like, what, like second two three at most james cameron said about three seconds yeah yeah exactly that's what i'm thinking so would they had time to to realize what was happening just like oh shit, that yeah and over that's what he said yeah. he said they probably had just enough time to hear an alarm and that was it yeah. the, the the thing that struck me was learning that it was built from carbon fiber because i i yeah. used to dive and and one of the things that you learn is that um one of the advantages of both glass and steel, especially in a in a spheric shape, is that the water increases the density of uh, of those two materials the deeper you go. In fact, um, in an ideal scenario, if you can make a perfect glass sphere, it's actually stronger than steel at great depths because of the uh, the anamorphic qualities of glass. Hmm. versus crystalline quality of steel. So uh, uh, and is... it's able to squeeze down to incredible hardness where you can you can shoot a bullet at it uh, at those depths and the glass will not break. I mean, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, Coulter. No, I was just going to add. So just, just for a point of conversation, if this is something that happened at 1,600 feet, which reportedly would have been about the depth they were at when they were going down on Sunday – then they would have been at about um, 693 pounds per square inch. Wow. At yeah. That point. yeah. And, and carbon really fiber, I, I, carbon fiber does not work the same way as an anamorphic um, 
substrata like glass does no. or, or even steel, uh, mm. it, it, you are basically you are basing its strength on its ability to reduce to to uh, resist pressure, whereas steel and glass use the pressure to become stronger. Well, and I'm not very science oriented. Maybe you know this, Paul, and that's why I ask. Like, you wouldn't really want to use a fiber anyway because no. fibers no, expand it won't. and contract, right? And not only that, it's well, yeah, no, well, fibers it's, don't do that at all. Fibers shatter, shatter. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. That's the problem. Yeah. Go steel, go watch the latest and Le Mans can race. Expand and contract. That's what and I that's mean. Why okay. they can be all reinforced, right. but fibers can shatter. The flexibility um, is really important in the material. Go watch the latest Le Mans where they ran off the road and the, the shells of those fiber carbon fiber right, cars right. just absolutely exploded. Now, obviously those are very thin products, but I cannot conceive of, uh, you know, based on my past knowledge and tutelage. Wouldn't it absorb stuff too, in a way? No. I mean, no, no, it shatters. No, no, it has no full. It has no, um, no real resistance. No, uh, no, 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 no flexibility. Yeah. That's what I was curious about. Okay. Car carbon fiber, when it goes, it's done. Like there, there is no mid, midpoint to it. It Doesn't won't have any give to it at all. No, here. none, none. It's none. different it than like dent. cotton fibers. Okay, that's what I was curious about because I'm not. I wasn't. Yeah, it becomes. It, it actually just becomes like glass particles or razor blades yep. or whatever you want to think right. of it. When it shatters. Yeah, it's and this is like the issue that many also had with this yeah. death machine, which what? is exactly what it was. It was a death machine uh, because. Um, Cameron and everyone else were like, you can't make something like this out to fiberglass. It just, just doesn't work. Like, this is the wrong kind of material. And if they're, yeah. if they're joining different styles of material, so let's say there is some steel or some right. glass, how do you join it to carbon fiber? There's really no Yeah, and if you're under really different kinds way. of pressures and temperatures and yep. stuff, like that's what I was thinking too is because, yeah... Yeah. All right. That makes sense. Action Con says, I would not get on that submarine for one simple reason. The pressure hall was not a sphere. All serious subs use a sphere. That CEO was warned not to use a cylinder. The Russian submersibles have, uh, are, are uh, tubular, like a... Like and where did that get I them? I mean, most all? submarines are, are extended <laughs> long tubular, too. Like, that's the other Yeah, part. yeah. I mean, uh, well, yeah, when you're talking with like a probe, like a submersible probe, spheres are usually good. James Cameron's submersible wasn't a sphere. It was more like a giant fin. And they were all the Russian ones. He went down mostly with the Russian ones. Wasn't his more like a teardrop shape uh, script? It was, very uh, it, it's hard, it was hard to tell because all the shots that I've seen of it look more like a shift, uh, a, a, the fin of a, of a fish. But it might have it? some of a curvature to it. Yeah, that gives it also like a teardrop shape as well. But I, I thought I thought he went down in that white lotus submersible from James Bond. Oh wow! Well, that, there you go. <laughs> well, he he went down in a number one, but and a number of the different ones. But he and another guy built one over like nine years to go to yes. the, uh, the the Challenger of the Mariana Deep. Trench, which is not Ch the Titanic one. Yeah. yeah, the Challenger Deep Trench, and yeah. he went yeah. And that uh, is more than twice as deep as the uh, Titanic, actually. More I was going to say uh, almost three times as deep. Here's the one with that that uh, Cameron went down, and it was kind of it looks spherical from the outside on this end, but yeah, once you look on this end, it's more like a, like a uh -huh. yeah, you can see it. It's more like a submarine, yeah. And and here's I'd another safer in that one. Titanic, yeah. And and here's another filmmaker who is uh, loves his gear porn. Yeah. And I'm I'm just trying to think of which of the movie uh, Disney movie makers would be interested in this story from a technical perspective. <laughs> KK would. I'm sure KK was following this oh, religiously. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the only one who could probably do it with any tact would be him. Uh, and it actually oh, yeah. be correct in any way. You know what? I'd be all for James Cameron making a movie on the Titan. Well, and, and that's kind of what I've been griping about you know, him wasting so much time on avatars, like all these other things he could. Yeah. I wish he'd be done with avatar. Get on to something else, but it is what it is. Um, let's get a few more of these out of the way so we can get to the main topic of the day. Um, let's see here on this point. Uh, Mark's on 11, seven B says in the words of a comedian, it's not too soon. It's perfect time to do so. The event is fresh on everyone's mind. Paul is writing jokes right now. Well, <laughs> 
it's, yeah. it's, it's more so like, you know. Well, it depends well, on what's your angle with how you're making yeah, fun of this yeah. situation. Are you doing it like – like you're making fun of the rich because it's popular right. to hate the rich, or are you doing it because you're making fun of incompetence? Right, and that's where I was coming from earlier. Like the play stupid games, win stupid prizes. That yeah, yeah th this is a little bit like that. Yeah, like yeah. no one wants to see anyone die over this. At the same time, when talking about avoidable deaths and potential candidates for Darwin Awards. This is like one of the key examples. Pinochet's I... helicopter. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, Pinochet's helicopter tour says U.S. Navy tasked Bob Ballard with a classified mission for locating the USS Thresher, USS Scorpion, NK-129, which led to the discovery of the Titanic. Yeah. This is true. This is very true. It's a tremendously fascinating story yeah. behind the discovery of Titanic. I actually remember very vaguely in the news when that was found. There's yeah. like two news items that i remember from my childhood because like they stood out that much one was the finding of the titanic i didn't know what it was but i remember it happened and then it was chernobyl which was the next year yeah i remember the titanic thing because yeah there was like this resurgence of titanic historical stuff and all that stuff yeah marx 11 7b says i may not be rich but the price of 250k is too cheap especially now that i've learned it started at 100k originally Cheapness knows no bounds. Apparently, they spent a million bucks just in fuel to go down there. And I went, then I wonder, like, what the hell well, kind of battery fuel do they use? It was battery operated. So even worse. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's too bad. Uh, Elusive says, uh, with $5, thank you so much. As tasteless as some, as some on the memes concerning the Titan are, the one... Uh, of it painted as Dylan's Bud Light can is the meme of the decade. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, I, I have God. to see this one. I haven't seen, I haven't that, seen one. that one. Yeah. Oh, so wow. that's, you, you need to send that's that to on Twitter or something. Yeah. That's well, and it gets worse because what's your first thought? Says, could this be considered the first DIE? <laughs> I, I, sadly, there probably is more. Um, well, when you take a look at the Passion Manifest, none of them really, none of the people that are crewed on that really qualify for DEI. I was going to say, there's other things you could probably put there. It was more there. more of an intention. Right. I mean, if you had, like, put, like, uh, some diversity. Like, like, to be fair, the CEO, he went down and he went down. Yeah, he went down with a chip. Yeah. yeah. 421 Spaceman says, read that one of them was a relative of one of the original Titanic victims. Very eerie, if true. If yes, it is. Yeah, but that's it, true. Is it really? Okay. Yeah, wow. it is true. I mean, and also, uh, the... How shall I put this? The conspiracy theories, you know, those things that have a tendency of becoming true, are going completely rife with some of the people on this and their political connections and stuff aye, like aye, this, aye. and how that echoes some of the political connections. <laughs> well, of, with the original, how would we have, how would we have yeah. reacted? How would we have reacted if Shatner had uh, bought it on the Bezos trip? Well, I was going to bring that up earlier has too. too. Yeah, I was going to bring that up really too. Is how much are these people risking when they're going up in these uh, private space flights? I I would say actually you do risk a hell of a lot more going up in this thing right here, going down under the water where you risk yep. catastrophic implosion Probably. in something that's cobbled together and homemade, versus going up into space. Because to be fair, going up into space is something that where the theoretical framework has been done for a long, long time. It has been done many times over. It is always risk associated with it. But whoever goes into space, that is something that is tested up and down and through the gasu so many times before they send some someone up. And the the humans that were lost uh, were lost in uh, in Challenger mm -hmm. and in what's the other one? Colombia. Colombia. Thank you. In both of those cases, you had like warning signs in advance that something could oh, yeah. go wrong here. Yeah. Well, they they were the, the Columbia was more of a hopeless situation because mm -hmm. they every the, the mission started off fine, but when they were doing the examination before reentry, uh, that's when they found out that they were missing a tile. But they had to make the risk because they couldn't they had nowhere else to go. There's no way that could get up to them. Yeah. 
John Doe says, Shadow, as a spy thriller, how does Secret Invade Invasion, I think he means, compared oh. to Sandbaggers? Thanks for the recommendation, by the way. Love Sandbaggers. Sorry I missed this earlier when we were talking about the Secret Invasion. I don't know if it came in after or not, but uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there are uh, consequences to people's actions, and you, you, you know, no, there's no comparison. Sandbaggers is, I, I think, especially when you get into later episodes, because it's kind of old and slow at the very beginning. But uh, it's it's riveting with uh, real uh, consequences. There's just no consequences in Secret Invasion. That that's really its biggest uh, its its biggest fault. Well, let's uh, wait and see with that. Well, so far from one episode, it doesn't feel like. Yeah, yeah, much no, that I that I agree yeah, with. Yeah, they 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 fail to stop an attack, but we don't know. Next episode is when we find out what will that actually result in. Yeah, and and you know when you've when you've got this taciturn leader in Sandbaggers who's finished a a dreadful uh, marriage, and he vows never to fall in love again, and ends up falling in love with a, a new female Sandbagger, and then she gets sent into a situation which requires a horrific uh, decision. Boy, does it hit you like a ton of bricks because you're rooting for Neil Burnside to finally have a decent life because his life sucks as the head of the sandbaggers. And, uh, and finally he has something decent in his life. And, and uh, wow, I mean, that, that, that was, that, that's an amazing series of episodes here <laughs> in secret invasion, not quite the same thing. I'm not invested in any individual's problem. Yeah, no, that I agree with. There's nothing to be invested in. There's no, there's no character to get invested in here so far. Absolutely not. But I'm I'm glad you like sandbaggers. Yeah, thank you, John Doe, for the uh, super chat. Um, and then we got Jesus Davila who gifted a membership. Thank you so much, Jesus. Ian Carroll's who says now I need to make an Overwatch play of play of the game montage for the Titanic. Okay. Ooh. Uh, your pal Russ says, uh, I could get you to sign a waiver if that's all right, not to shoot you in the head, but obviously it's not. I'll, I'll tell you my wife on my 50th birthday got me a ride on a NASCAR, uh, track, uh, with a professional NASCAR driver to go three times around the track. And the waiver I signed was basically... If they have to scrape you off the tarmac, they owe you nothing, owe your family nothing. And then here's this helmet that they just sprayed with Lysol. Go have fun. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that'll that'll protect you. And I'm telling you, uh, that was an experience I will never forget. Once the centrifugal force hit and I was smashed into the right side of the passenger side of the car, I could not unglue my head out of the meshing. <laughs> it was just stuck there oh man and the guy was like literally two inches from the concrete wall and just nailing it around the track and i'm looking at it because my head is right there wow anyways yeah the waiver was probably very similar to what they signed yep probably yes yeah uh, and then we have uh, Stian Monstad, who probably sent us some popcorn, I bet. Thank you uh, for I that. I think it's a thumbs up. Is it a thumbs up? All right. We'll hit that thumbs up if you haven't already. Thank you, Six. Marks 11 b says, Andre, that warning of failure is why carbon fiber isn't used. Metal will bend and warp. The fibers hold until they break completely all at once. Yeah, that's what I was kind of trying to yeah. get my head around there. And thank you for that, Marksman. Uh, Horseradish Power says, when the Titanic broke and sank fast, there were survivors in air uh, I think it's pockets in the back half, and they had 30 seconds of descent before the pressure imploded the pockets. The oh, implosion would, would have been instant death, horrible. And yeah, well, it's yeah. probably better than drowning, at least. But yeah, I, I know, think like a, uh, pick your well, poison, I guess, well, at that here, point. Here's like the thing they would be, uh, I mean, yeah, okay, Tom, here's the thing they drowned. 
it imploded the pockets. It didn't crush them. It's not like... Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened is that that's when the air pockets were were uh, were imploded. But that was just the air pockets. It wasn't a catastrophic implosion which killed them. No, no, no. That's when they had the joy of drowning. Oh, oh boy. Yeah, and that was actually... Yeah. Like, uh, like, like my... To me, one of the most horrific, like uh, big sim uh, sinkings like that, is what happened to the MS Estonia, uh, which happened in the Baltic Sea. I think in, like in the late nineties or something. I remember like two of those big ship uh, ship sinkings, uh, which were in my lifetime. That was Scandinavian Star. I remember that because two in my school were on it because I was in school at the time. And then it was the MS Estonia. And what was so horrible with that thing? is that the, the front of it, of the car deck, it had like this really shitty design. So the front car deck just opened and it filled up with water during the storm. And the water was like sloshing back and forth that it shifted the center of the gravity. So the whole thing just tipped over in a second. Mike, no this had, is like, why I warning. fish from land. This is why what? This is why I fish from land. Well, that's why we're on the island. We're just going to fish from the land. That's right. Then we I'm going to drug you, and then I'm going to take you out on a boat. Oh, shit. What would you say, Six? We could throw some fish in, in Nike's uh, pool. I don't mind boats, but I, I'm not going anywhere near any lane, huge mass of water that could consume me in seconds. Fuck I that. think that's a white people thing. You don't see Mexicans doing all kinds of crazy. You said you don't swim. I do swim, but I ain't gonna like try to freaking try to go block myself in a tank. No, 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 Mike. Remember, remember Aqua, no Aqua man. Remember Black Panther. Like you Mexicans, you are blue now, and you live oh, underwater. Oh, that's right. I forgot. That's right. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, Craig. You know until, until until you need to come into Wakanda illegally over the river. I, I, I you know, and I'm I'm surprised, Mike, you weren't on it because the thing is in the shape of a burrito. He doesn't ah! really like as much Mexican food as you'd think. No. Especially Americanized crap. Yeah. But uh, speaking of being blue, I'm blue because uh, we got a loose culture. Yeah. I'm from yeah culture. There's just too many people on this panel. See you later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and plug your wares, sir. I know you have to take off on us. Yeah, no, uh, I did. Uh, I got a couple videos out today. Obviously, I do my live shows. And after this show's over, you can catch me on the Friday pre flight, uh, my midday introduction to the weekend, uh, where I, you know, talk about what I think everybody's going to talk about this weekend, which I think is going to be a really disappointing box office. But um, yeah, anyway, thanks for having me as always. And, too. Yeah, I think I know. Uh, anyway, What's the think, next High Rollers live stream, the month's almost over. I think we probably can do it on Sunday, uh, Mikey. Oh, we're doing Midnight Set Sunday. That's news to me. So, all right. Membership I'll stream. Membership I'll figure stream. it out. I'll figure it out. Yeah. All right. See you later. Love you guys. Take Bye. care. Take care. Uh, and then let's see here. We've got a few more of these. Uh, DCB Titan sends in 10 Canadian. It says there's an interview with in Fortune with an ex Ocean Gate employee who had concerns with the Titan, like apparently using a window rated for pressure at 1300 M. When they plan to go about four thousand M, I'll meet them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I seen some of the interviews, but like, if it wasn't for guys like Paul and Andre and Script explaining some of this shit to me, I'd be completely lost. So, full disclosure on that. Pinochet's helicopter tours uh, sends in two dollars and says Michael Bean's last seen in the abyss. Yeah, that's what happened yeah. to them. That's what happened to them. Um, Zero on says Ant Man equals Victoria Alonso, Little Mermaid equals DEI Lady, e Elemental equals CFO Lady. If Indy fails, whose head do you think would roll? Um, somebody you've never met before, but they'll take all the blame. Yep. Uh, like what's her face back during the Last Jedi? And I can't even remember her name. Here. Kiri Hart. Yeah, she who already took the blame and went. She'll fire her own husband. She'll be like. Get out of here, Frank. You'd be like, thank God. <laughs> You're not wrong. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she would turn around and say, for Frank Marshall, he's real, really overrated. It was always me that was the source behind his success, and he fucked this movie up for me. So he's There's some around. kind of rumor going around that I heard this morning that it was Harrison Ford who specifically picked Phoebe Waller Bridge for the role. Nope, not true. The the actual video interview says that the first time he met her was uh, in Mangold's office and he was ah, introduced okay. to her by Mangold. 
So this is how they're. This is obviously this is um, fake news. Uh, bailing, yeah, bailing, bailing water. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Exactly Thanks for right. the clarification. That's why or, I come to this channel. Or a little bit more of what we were talking about last night on Midnight's Edge After Dark, where we were talking about payola scandals in in Hollywood and how that's kind of becoming a topic of conversation. But yeah, when it comes to Kathleen Kennedy, I seen this last night and I couldn't I could not respond. Um, if I had made you executive producer for Spielberg and Lucas, we wouldn't even know you and you wouldn't talk to us because you'd be like running like Sony. Well, and again, the, the, notice what they're leaving off of this list. Shit like milk money and other crap you've never heard of because it flopped. Because anytime sh she has worked with anybody who wasn't Spielberg, Zemeckis, or in the few cases, uh, M. Night Shyamalan with, uh, I think, The Sixth Sense and Airbender and stuff like that, it's been no-name nobodies you don't know because their movies flopped. Yeah, pretty much. And, uh, and some of this I would call a bullshit on because most of these she's only a producer on because Spielberg was producing them. Kathleen Kennedy working as a producer without Steven Spielberg being there either as a co-producer, and then I mean active co-producer or director, is a recipe for disaster. Because I'll tell the you right of, now... Yeah. Go ahead, no, I was just gonna just to like establish the point that uh, that her number of successful movies, which uh, weren't directed or actively co-produced by Steven Spielberg, is zero. Yeah, and and the only one on here that I can see that Spielberg also produced that they actually did stuff on because I know it was her and Frank did work heavily on the Back to the Future and Jurassic franchise after Steven left. Gremlins, I've never heard Frank or Kathy's name ever come up once. It always, Steven, 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 Steven. Same thing with Goonies. Same thing with American Tale. I don't understand this where people think that she deserves any sort of fucking credit. And what's funny is you put this right in the middle, which is hilarious. Like, that's supposed to help your fucking case. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't think she had anything really to do with uh, uh, Poltergeist. Poltergeist either. Because, again, whenever they talk about producing, that's where I think people misconstrued this idea that Stephen Ghost directed that movie, which he did not. He just was a producer. He was there as an active producer. Exactly. <laughs> as I said, the movies where he's an active producer, as long as Steven Spielberg has like an active part in it, it's going to be fine. It's the moment when he's a producer in name only where Kathleen Kennedy is the actual active one, then it goes to hell. In now, there could be an argument that was to Toby Hooper a bit more of a work-for-hire director? Yes. <laughs> like, that. that's a different conversation to be had. But anyway, what do we got left for these uh, Titan uh, messages here, Six? Uh, where'd I leave off? Do we know? Thank you so much. Horse Radish Power says, Moral of the story, build your deep-sea subs like Battlestar Galactica, rugged and analog, and no Bluetooth game controller, for goodness sakes. Well, the, the Bluetooth thing, and I think Script already addressed this, was really just kind of a... That didn't really actually control everything. It was just so that the people inside could actually have some fun inside, but actually... Was, no, no. They, well, they could have made a wired one at the very least. Digitally. They had no manual that's option. It, yeah. um, they, well, I mean, they used the, the like a game controller, but that's no different to the type of controller that Cameron used... It was just more off the over the counter. Cameron used a, essentially a thumb thumb joystick controller device for his stuff because you need something small in there <laughs> to to be able to navigate. And um, yeah, no, they had just no manual options. And like the only manual thing was the bolting of the of the hatch to to get in there. And I think it was like seventeen volts, and it's only done from the outside, so you can't you can't escape from the inside. Oh, that's uh, lovely. I mean, that's that's how you learn the lessons from the space program when they when like all those astronauts burned to death because they couldn't get, escape from like the practice pod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Action Com says no shadow and script. The cockpit of the Mir One and Mir Two, and Cameron submarine all use spheres for the cockpit. You didn't say cockpit. You said hull. Action Com. Yeah. <laughs> you said hull. <laughs> uh, then he says, "Where did you first hear about the Titanic? I learned about it from the children's television show Voyagers." episode voyagers of the titanic yeah. honestly i probably the first time i remember hearing about it is when andre was just talking earlier about when they discovered it because it was probably when i was young enough that that's i mean i'm sure i was aware of it but that's like we got bombarded with like 
Titanic historical stuff. Yeah, it was in the eighties. It was discovered, right? Exactly. Yeah. Five, eight to five. That, yeah. That sounds like about that's... right. Yeah. So to me, I mean, there's like bef before the fall of the Berlin Wall, there's exactly two store new stories that I remember. The first time I heard about the Titanic was when it was reported that Ballard had actually found the wreckage of the Titanic because that was like a huge thing in the news. So this was 1985. I was four, maybe five at the time, depending on what time of year it was. And I just remember it was like a big deal. So I learned about it then. It was like a big freaking ship that sunk. And, and then I didn't really think more about it until the movie came in 1997. So that's like when I really learned more details. What's with the movie like most everyone yeah. else at the time? didn't? And I believe it was also delayed from 96, a typical Cameron movie. Yeah. And then also before then, I read the, the movie, sorry, I read the book Starship Titanic, which I thought was fantastic by, uh, yeah. what's his face, the guy, Pratchett, yeah. Mm. And Pratchett? then uh, Iron Caster reminds me that Lake Superior will get you, Tom. Yeah, well, that's why I don't go swimming in Lake Superior. <laughs> that's far enough away from me. Uh, Horseradish Power says the survivors said the worst part was not hearing the screams. Oh no, it was the silence and those in the water had nine minutes before freezing to death. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Okay, Ex Morbius says uh, I was confused by what Andre said. Wouldn't an implosion crush the passengers? Thanks. No, but yes. here's like the uh, yes, not in the big in thing the, like the Titanic. The, the Titanic, Titanic thing. It's more like a. Uh, it didn't really crush them, but something caved in, and then the air was rapidly escaping while water was coming in, as a, yeah. and it was probably almost instantaneous. Yeah, but, where an implosion uh, involves, especially at those depths, would be the oxygen heats up, and then everything is crushed, uh, and then it goes very, very cold. So it, it happens all in fractions of a second, and yeah, it's it's very gruesome. Well, I hope so, but I know that many of the people who were inside of the Titanic, uh, they drowned on the way yep. down. They didn't have the luxury of, uh, yeah. of dying. That's such a quick death, yeah. Most so, like, in the Titan, the submersible, yeah, they didn't feel anything. The people in the Titanic, those who were still trapped inside, the vast majority of them got the pleasure of uh, dying while drowning. DCB Titan says going up is easy. You just have to keep all the same things in. Going down is hard because you have to keep more and more stuff out. Okay. Yeah, what he means is basically it's uh, it's increasing water pressure that has right. to be kept uh, kept out and off the hull. Or Minist least, uh, well, yeah. Ministry of Wrong Things thing ugh, says for nine ninety nine. Thank you so much. I assume you guys already heard talked about the, how James Cameron knew. The sub had imploded and even got information of it days ago by the government. We had we had broached that, and if not, we definitely touched on it in between now and the time you sent in the uh, super he, chat. He was pretty yeah. confident on Monday, and then that's what he said. He, yeah, he learned about it a few days later uh, from a source, but not a confirmed uh, announcement. And then the government yeah. did their re uh, release of it yesterday. Yeah, but the yeah. interview I heard, seen him, he said flat out, like the moment he heard about it, he knew they were probably the moment here. he heard that there was a bang. He's like, yeah. yeah, he knew. He was like, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, like you all the he said he held out hope, and he actually, I think, he even kind of called out the media for holding out hope that long for the family, yeah, yeah, like, um, because most people that know this stuff, I don't claim to be an expert, I'm just reading what they're saying, but the, but the 20 people that do know this stuff, they were all of the opinion that, yeah, this thing imploded and it did so on Sunday. At least I think that was him. That, that, it was one of the interviews I was, and I didn't listen to too many. And I think it was him that called. He's like, "Yeah, it was kind of." Can't remember how he put it, but he basically said in so many words, "It was kind of shitty of the media and, and other people to kind of keep these hopes alive when I knew there wasn't." He's like, "I was hoping there were, but he's like the way they did it." I'm pretty sure that was him. Yeah. Well, I need to keep your keep the, the attention away from some bigger story. <laughs> yeah, let's not even get to that. Well, I mean, the thing is that there's enough ambiguity with regards to what the bang noise could have been. been. It could have been the battery. Uh, gave out and the hull was still able to remain intact and they were just kind of slowly could have been something completely unrelated yeah, yeah. could have been something of it could have been the sub hit something and was still stable they like again there's a lot of exploration as to what 
it could possibly be, but the most likely yeah. one would be like if that if that bang was heard by by sonar and and it was described in a way that was um uh uh louder than a normal hit or an object coll collision then it would most likely have been an implosion at the end of the day like andre said too there's only like maybe 15 to 20 actual specialists when it comes to this shit and i i would say cameron's one of them oh yeah well, the absolutely. other part too is they they heard uh repeated banging and that's kind of what caused the confusion so they didn't know if it was just like them trying to create a pattern to say that you know like yeah like an SOS. In, in yeah. distress but the thing is, as soon as they didn't hear it again, that's kind of usually when you know. Yeah, in, in, in hindsight, and this is just me speculating and guessing here, kind of going off of the interviews and stuff that I heard, it, the multiple bangings was probably the first bang was the implosion and the other bangs was like stuff scuff. Because don't they go along like down like where there's a dip in like uh, like a side of a cliff, but it's underwater? How they showed it on the... No, it's all flat over there. So it, it basically okay. would just be a, the bang of the implosion and then the, the bang of the... The debris stuff hitting the know, ground, hitting the ground, yeah, yeah, okay. I didn't know if it'd be stuff like dragging across the side of like the, the rocks or something like that that they would hear, maybe it would sound like banging, but okay. Well, anyway, DCB Titan says, Just saw the news low bar that baby shark toys are being recalled because of laceration risk. What, like, duh, it's a shark. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, but kids are playing with it, so I guess, yeah, if there's a yeah, 200 watt studio says, When they saw Titanic, they got all misty. Well. They sadly probably never even got a chance to, to see it. So uh, yeah, no, I do believe it was on the way down. So That's what Cameron was saying. Even, yeah, yeah, never even got to see. So, it. But they did get end up being buried right next to it. So sadly, yeah. What what's left of them? Achievement Rob. unlocked. Rob Miles says, "I appreciate a sandbagger's reference on Midnight's Edge. It was created by Ian McIntosh, who died in a plane crash in Alaska in '79. My aunt Susan, his girlfriend, also died in that crash. Thanks, Chad. Oh, sorry to hear that, Rob. Oh, sorry, Rob. Sorry for your loss. Yeah, sad. Um, and then we've got uh, Mario Trillio who says, to quote Ron White, "You can't fix stupid. Stupid is forever. Money only makes the failures more epic. Just look at Lucasfilm. And on that note, Pilgrim Media gets us into one of the main topics of the day." Leslie Headland exit story was premature. Yeah, I don't. I, I honestly, uh, when I heard this, we story, never reported that, did we? I, I that was the last. Like, in what world do you live in that you think Leslie Headland's fired? I mean, I don't, wait, what? Someone's saying that she's fired? <laughs> it's it's not outside the confines of reality, but we didn't report it. Let's put it that way. Let me put it to you this way. They're probably close to being done with the Acolyte, so if she's not around, that's why. It's probably almost done with post-production and all that shit. They're getting to that point where, yeah. As far as we know, it's all been shot. They've been starting to put out, like, character stuff. In fact, I just heard yesterday that they got a non-binary character played by a non-binary actor. Yay. I, I, oh, I can yeah. hardly wait. Exactly. That's 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 really going to save them. I, people will be flocking to Disney Plus now. I'm sure. Maybe they can do like a sponsorship with uh, with Bud Light on it. I think they're going to get flocked. Probably. But that note aside, uh, the future of the Force uh, is female, of course, uh, as you're saying in the headline under Kathleen Kennedy and uh, Leslie Headland's acolyte. I think that is pretty obvious. Um, and, and Kathy's also still, uh, still threatening us with a Leslie Headland Indiana Jones series, but Andre, take us through our headlines since you put it up there. Yeah. Well, basically the story, this has been reported by WDW pro and a few others. It's even made its way to bounding into comics. Uh, so let's see if we can't uh, dig up the story there. Uh, this has to do with the future Star Trek movie, you know, the one that is to be directed by this activist from the World Economic Star Wars. Forum, Star Wars. Starring, uh, starring Ray. And uh, the leaked uh, slash rumored story in this movie, which will be focused on Ray training a female apprentice destined to emerge as the future leader. And uh, the leak here is actually relatively, relatively short. The gist of it is that Ray has two apprentices, a girl and a boy. And obviously, the boy doesn't measure up. 
Always two there are. Yeah. So it is to the <laughs> to the girl to carry on the legacy of Ray and to bring balance back to the Force and to read the books on how to be a Jedi in ten easy steps and continue the legacy that I really set up in the Mangle movies. So really, that's that's it. It's a further doubling down. So the next generation after Ray to to be the bestest ever. Jedi is, of course, another woman. So, are we surprised? Uh, let's begin with a woman on the panel. Uh, Six, have you been greatly enjoying the sequel trilogy? Are you looking forward to the Ray movie? And uh, does this uh, know that, uh, or does knowing that the next movie after this is going to be Ray Squared make you more excited <laughs> for it? I am not excited at all, but I am not surprised also because what else are they going to do? They've, they've killed off Han, they've killed off Luke, and Carrie Fisher is gone. So I don't know what else they have to cling to. The High Republic, excuse me, the High Republic bullshit is going on, you know, before the events of the prequels. And so unless they take off on a, on a tangent and don't reboot something, reuse something, then they have nowhere else to go, but forward with, with Ray and her amazing and wonderful students. I'm sure the, the female student is of course going to kick the butt of the male student. Yeah. Well, and just for some more context, because this leak came out and it come from Production Weekly, I think is the name of the publication that put it out. And what this is, is kind of like a pay-for-play kind of thing where you can, you, you you pay a subscription to this and they tell you, they give you the heads up where all the uh, auditions and stuff like that are going to be for uh, studios and whatnot. Uh, Script Doctor and I talked I mean, a little casting. bit about casting. Casting. <laughs> did what, I say, what did I say? I'm so sorry. Audition. Well, it's, it's a ca casting call. It's a connection to casting calls. Yes. Okay. Casting calls. Thank you. And and basically, so there's no real reason for them to make this up. As we were saying, this is probably the exact synopsis they got with whatever release they got from the studio or whoever. And that's what it was. Now, somebody has tried to run interference for this, which Pro said would happen. And there's a lot of people running with the story and and taking down this, this uh, synopsis saying it was debunked. When we've never actually gotten a name attached to it, we just have the famous old inside source at Lucasfilm. You know, the same one we heard from when Gina Carano was fired, probably. Because <laughs> it's not an actual name. It's not an actual official release. So it, let's be clear on that. Yes, somebody has debunked this, supposedly, claiming to be from Lucasfilm. That's all we know. Lucasfilm debunked it. Oh, that's very trustworthy. A source inside at Lucasfilm needs to be added to the front of that. Yeah. Guy in the mail room. Yeah, it could have been a guy in the mail room, or like I said, the same way that Gina Carano. Like again, I'm not saying they're not denying it, but it's a very simplified synopsis at the same time. So it's like, yeah, we all kind of figured this is basically what it was gonna be anyway. And at the same time, the funny thing to me was is when I read it last night, I said, now just replace Ray with Luke Skywalker. And that's what we wanted to begin with. <laughs> you know, isn't that funny? But anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, do I believe this? I do. Uh, what about you, Six? Do you believe this is an actual real synopsis? I do, but I is it possible that the, the trade or the production weekly wrote it themselves? Because you could have, AI could have written that based on what we know, what, based on what Kathleen Kennedy has said. There's Good nothing, point. I didn't learn anything from that. AI no, could right. write anything Kathleen Kennedy is associated with and do it better. But Script did point out that the, the opening line of that whole thing is almost verbatim what I believe Kathleen Kennedy said at the big Ray Ray announcement. Yeah. Yeah. But also the other part, too, is it's shooting fish in a barrel, easy to predict what Kathleen Kennedy would do based on that uh, previous information. It's Correct. anything that you say. If, if you were to say that she's training two female students, people would believe it. If you just said that she had a whole school of, of women aliens and whatnot, you'd believe. If you believe that she was just traveling the galaxy looking for the next student, and it looks like it's going to be a, a young girl on another planet like her, you'd believe it. 
Like that's how easy and probably be accurate. Is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. So the, it doesn't really make much of a difference at this point. The de the debunking of of this story synopsis is Lucasfilm said it's quote largely inaccurate and also quote just using general wording. So which is it? Uh, if, that's if, if they're like not going to information to me. It's they, they it's a big nothing burger, but then it's also largely inaccurate. I I don't think that source is large. Okay, so basically they hedged inaccurate. That's an admission that it's true. Well, and the fact that this isn't even an official debunking tells me everything I need to know. The fact that somebody would go out of their way to try and run any interference on this, because there's nothing to this. Like script and, and and six are just saying, we're really not getting anything that we couldn't have just made up on our own. By just going off of what we've heard already. It's pretty obvious what this is going to be. So I don't think that's really even the main story here. But the bigger story, I think, is just the fact that it doesn't sound like Kathy's going anywhere anytime soon. I think that's the headline kind of says here, too. But uh, uh, Andre, uh, Mikey, uh, you would you believe this thing? I've taken a different uh, approach to all of the what, whether this is coming out or when this is coming out or if this is coming out. Where I sit these days is I want them to release every garbage trash idea and put it out there because Star Wars has already died to me, and I just want to see them devalue their brand. At this point, I am not rooting for the return or the fixing of any Star Wars because it is so beyond recognition that I would rather just do what <clears> – <throat> I would rather wait two, de two or three decades when I'm on my deathbed and maybe get pleasantly surprised by something that might come out that's decent. Until then, I want them to keep releasing crap like Obi-Wan – Keep releasing crap like Boba Fett and keep disappointing me with boring ass crap that I somehow found a way to enjoy, uh, which was Andor. So I say release it all and I don't give a shit who's <laughs> behind it or whether it's Kathleen Kennedy or not or this one. or release. I don't give a shit who releases what. It's all crap. Release it all. That's I, my well, I rant. Get your wish. Paul, do you believe all this business? I'm with... Um, Mikey, I don't think I could describe it any better. Well, that's just because you want to buy a new boat. And if they do this, that just ups <laughs> the chances of that astronomically. That's a boat in the shape of a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a chalupa. Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, script Doctor, I think we've already kind of guessed yep. that you, you think it's probably real, but it doesn't really fucking matter at the end of the day. It doesn't matter at this point, and I'm 90% sure there isn't even a script written yet for them to even go into production or do anything. Right. Yeah. And then Andre... I want to, yeah, I believe it's completely. And I want to briefly revisit a point that was, uh, was made uh, in the very first Super Chat. Why would Bob Iger allow this? And here's like the thing. This is why Bob Iger also can't have anything to do with uh, with Star Wars, because he's guilty. Oftentimes, you need a complete change of God to do a complete reboot. You need to remove everyone that has any kind of ties to what came before in order to completely trash it and start over. Bob Iger was instrumental in the creation of the sequel trilogy. He is as responsible for Ray as was Kathleen Kennedy. And he can't even say it was all Kathy, even though that wasn't the case. He can't even pretend it because he wrote a book in which he took credit. So the success of the sequel trilogy and of Ray Skywalker is instrumental to his legacy too. If Ray doesn't succeed, that's an admission that his vision for Star Wars failed. And that, to me, is the big issue here. This is why Iger has got to go. Because uh, Star Wars can't be fixed as long as he's there. Because he's too closely tied to it. Ain't no fixing it while he's still in the room. Yeah, I don't think i can really say much more than that on that part um and i don't see her going anywhere until she's good and ready we've been saying this for a while um mecca j says kk the force is female huh and who's gonna i gotta i gotta oh, of course and, right. and let's just say she left tom who's gonna replace her that may or may not be any better 
Honestly. Well, no, and that's what I said last I night. I want to know who is the amazing person, because it ain't going to be no Favreau. He's not going to run a studio. I don't believe that for a second. He's not even an employee. He's not even in the org chart. He's a contractor. Well, and what did I say last night? I, I, you know, you know, we're yeah, we're all like, go away, Kathy. But we and don't stop what? to think of what's going to be in behind her. And most likely it's going to be Filoni as far as creative side of things. Shit, the day that she announces she's living, I'm the script is getting a plane ticket in his email box. I'm picking him up at LAX and I'm driving him over. My <laughs> guess is when she I'm literally leaves, gonna take I'm gonna duct tape script doctor to the door of Lucasfilm. When she leaves, <laughs> we are literally going to get a carbon copy of her only 40 years younger. She, that individual she is going to take over for all the business side of things, and Dave Filoni will be the head of creative, which he already is. And he will just continue to oversee all the creative side of Star Wars. Okay, great. Go so I go like from that. fifth wave, fifth wave feminist, lack of uh, creative moron, Kathleen Kennedy, overblown exec producer, to beta ass biatch Filoni and whatever crap he's going to give me. Is that those are my options? Yeah, relatively so, yeah. No, you're definitely getting duct taped to Lucasfilm's front door. You're not <laughs> leaving to your, my Star Wars gets fixed, script doctor. I'll bring you water and food. <laughs> I'll bring you a urinal. Oh, 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 yeah. I gotta think about that. Okay, yeah. I won't duct tape you. I won't duct tape you. Then that's right. As Megan J said here, KK says the force is female and Hunt says that's not how the force works. Are you trying to say the force is non-binary? No. Oh, no. Although technically, the uh, force is female came from Nike, not KK. That's right. True. Well, she, well, she co-opted it. So, what does it matter who came up with? Yeah, it? yeah. But I'm, also, I'm just giving her a break. But, but also, what is female anyway? I mean, this is can you define debate, it? Isn't it? So, I think you might as well. And if the acolyte light is anything to go by, the forces they them. That's right. Right, and and they've announced the first transgender character in Star Wars in the acolyte. Yeah, which that's, is uh, certainly one rumored. of. The, or maybe and, that's and, what I meant when I said non-binary. Sorry, that's what I meant, transgender. And and you know what? Never in the history of Hollywood have those kinds of attributes ever been a significant thing when announcing the casting of, of any film. Yeah. It, it, this, we're living in such pathetic times where the best you can possibly do is that this... Then we've introduced our first non-binary character. What, what, like just hire them, have them do their job, and let's see if they're good. What, why would that be a reason to watch a show? Right, right? I mean, we already knew C-3PO was gay. We didn't need anybody to tell us. <laughs> we did? It's pretty obvious. No, no C-3PO had nuts. Oh, I mean, well, he, it he doesn't was, matter. He, Him and R2 are a couple. That's pretty obvious. Okay. What? And 3PO is the bitch. Oh, but this God. is this is the immaturity of modern Hollywood, like chunks <laughs> of modern Hollywood and, and Disney, is that somehow this is a advertising benefit. In fact, it would turn more people off from the show. Yeah. I mean, look at look at how jealous 3PO gets whenever R2 sticks his thingy in another computer. Oh my God. Well, here and, I am. How, and he's like saying, well, I told you not to do it, motherfucker, when he gets the clap or zapped or whatever the fuck that is from that. <laughs> well, he and, couldn't and tell between a power port the power and socket. A, and yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, there's a link in the chat for you in the private chat. Oh, Lord, what now? And, and, and here we're doing weird stuff because I'm being serious and Tom isn't. I know. I try to. <laughs> I'm on vacation. Oh. Uh, anyway, uh, Stony D says, member for 17 months. Uh, so how does Ray know if her male protege is worse than the female one? Uh, how would she know the difference between them? Is she a biologist? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah, there's that. Funny. Well, the female one is six foot two and has an Adam's apple. <laughs> wow. And then Ministry of Wrong Things says, so a literal unnamed no, -uh is debunking now. Yeah, yeah. basically. Uh, and what I'm, what I find funny about it is not so much that, that somebody is debunking it and that people are writing about it. it. That's fine. It's the fact that some of these places are pulling down their original stories over it. It's like, wait a minute, that's not even a confirmed source. Maybe you know who the source is, 
but you're not telling us jack shit. You know, you're just telling us a source inside of Lucasfilm. Who? Like, like, like Six said, the janitor. Well, uh, Leslie he Headland being tossed would be a good house cleaning. See, here's the thing. There's, there's, there could be people running with that because after this, maybe she only is contracted to one year. The acolyte. That doesn't mean that she's beyond that, and people could conceive that as being fired. I guess I'm not putting any credence to this rumor that's going around, but Matt, yeah. a contract is a contract. If it's not renewed, exactly. you're, still, you're not fired. You're just not renewed. It's different. That's how Hollywood works. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Only if maybe... you are ejected in the midst of a production, which can you actually claim that you're fired? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't even the acolyte wasn't the one they were getting sued over. It was that other one. Wasn't it script doctor that that one lady sued over? No, no, it was Acolyte. It was, was it Acolyte? Sued over. It was Acolyte, and, and yeah. Okay, well, okay. They filed, their tax, they filed their paperwork in time to not have their assets seized in the UK, so everything's... Oh, that's not even what I was talking about. I was talking about the lady that was suing Lucasfilm. Yeah, it was for yes, the Acolyte. Yes, that's over Acolyte. That was, okay, well, the only way... I, okay, well, that was why I was asking for is because say because the only way I could see her getting fired is going to have nothing to do with anything other than the chaotic mess that this show might have been behind the scenes between getting sued the stuff that script just mentioned about the, the assets getting seized and all that kind of crap. And even that would be very unlikely. Why? It was, especially if the show's almost done by now. Well, it's not only that, pointless. I mean, uh, for Headland as the showrunner, she doesn't really have much say as to who, what type of accountants and what exactly. type of infrastructure is worked on, on her show. Uh, there's only coordination through that. That's usually appointed by the studio. And then she coordinates with them with regards to what she needs to make the show happen. And they're supposed to be doing their job to make sure that is achieved within the budget constraints that the studio has imposed on them. That's, yeah. that's my understanding of what it, what her job would be in that regard. So the whole failing to file the paperwork on time and having to, having to meet the deadline that, you know, at the last second that I would, you'd have to really stretch a lot to try and make that her fault. Yeah, it's a little different than like somebody actually leaving in the middle of production, like you said. DCB Titan says, speaking of High Republic, I read the description of one book and it and needs scripts help. What would rich intern third person dialogue even look like? Rich internal third person dialogue? Like the narrator, maybe? <laughs> I guess. Because the narrator's a third person if they're telling you the story and then they'd have their own thoughts with it, like um, but then it's also like if they're also involved in the story, this the first person that's a that's a tricky one there. Yeah, <laughs> sure I was gonna say because normally as a narrator, unless you're a character and you just said it yourself, unless you're a character in the story, you're not really supposed to editorialize the story itself. Yeah, like I mean, a, a, an easy one to think of is um, Catcher in the Rye. It's a first person narrated narrative tale with an unreliable narrator, and it's a great book. Third person stuff, you usually don't really know the character you're. You're discussing. And it's more of an account, not an actual yeah. investment in, in it emotionally. That's where I said there's the difference between somebody who's invest, you know, actually in the story and invested in it. Then you can editorialize, right? You can give like insight into how somebody may be feeling or acting in a way I mean, and how really, you react a to third it. Person, like, yeah. A third person dialogue is just the author. Like the author is That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm yeah, I, I don't if the author is talking to you, the reader, that's your third person dialogue and, and they're not any of the characters in the story then yeah it's i don't that's a that's a new one for me i have to i have to admit i've never i guess really heard of that tolkien <laughs> no, i don't think his is don't know. It's really internalized it's it's just there yeah i don't know about the internal third person thing like i don't get that part i guess dc titan is what's th throwing me off now if you want to Rich third person dialogue, yes. Yeah, so you don't, you well, know, that just means in dialogue, tertiary yeah. characters, <laughs> like, exactly. I mean, yeah, so I'm not sure on the question here if you want to clarify DCB. No, no, I think he, yeah, I think he's just quoting it because he doesn't know either. And I, I think, oh, is that what it said on the back of the book? Then if that's the case, then they're fucking retards, yeah, <laughs> yeah, with, with a capital R because that, that, the conversation script and I just had proved that because it makes no sense. Or maybe it was somebody reviewing one of the High Republic books and they were just chilling and looking for a way to flesh out their... Oh, it might just be a... Uh, might have been a typo where it's supposed to say rich internal first person dialogue. That's just that what I was sense? thinking here. Yeah, unless you're schizophrenic, I don't know how that works. <laughs> you... <laughs> 
I mean, do you talk in the third person perhaps? But anyway, we're going to be losing Paul here. So, Paul, you brought this up too uh, with the whole transgender actor thing. I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that before <laughs> you took off here. Well, I mean, again, it's uh, from just a... I, I don't understand why this is an attribute that is used as a selling proposition. I don't get it. Just I, I have no issues with a trans actor uh, in a in a show. Like who cares? Um, just like let's let's see how good you are and and uh, how well the show works. And that's really all that matters. But that's really the issue we have now. Is that that seems to be the only bullet and the only gun that all these uh, social justice warriors seem to be seem to have like uh, this is what's making their work boring so it's tedious well, like who cares i would i would as writers just kind of revolt at this point with a shit too because it's just getting ridiculous and actors too it's like i'm si if i was somebody who was being tokenized like that and i said this way back when with the discovery yeah, yeah. It's like basically it's no different than the old circus freaks and stuff. You're being but I agree but the modern actor that way, yeah. The modern actor is happy to be tokenized in because some ways yeah, you're because right. they're representing now. They say it themselves. You're none not of wrong. this none of this helps the marketing of the movies or TV shows. You know. And I, and I say that in my most recent video. I mean, how many people knew that Cary Grant and Randolph Scott lived together? Like, who cares? At the time, it might have been a rumor, which the movie going public probably didn't want to hear about. But now, you know, we know that uh, Quinto is gay, uh, 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 Neil Patrick Harris, N uh, Ian McKellen, nobody cares but none of them talk about it in their interviews. They just do their work and they're good at their jobs. But at Disney, again, this is the sociopaths that they've got running the place that somehow these attributes are more relevant than story writing uh, and production. Yeah, and of course that comes straight from the top. I mean, just look at what Aikir is talking about when he goes and he talks about what essentially is stakeholder capitalism, how they're changing the world. Right. They're really just following the, the company mandate there. Yeah, and uh, you know what? I, I, you know, if I started another company, I, I would advertise best people only, don't care whether you're white, black, gay, trans, whatever. If If I hire you, the world will know it's because you are the best. And that would that would just shock everybody. That would be very problematic. Yes, it would be very problematic. Wait a second, you can't hire the best? That's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> I would be very problematic. I mean, that, I, that's, I believe that's some, some level of supremacy of some kind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we guarantee we'll be in on time. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's very dangerous. Yeah you, yeah, you might even expect people to show up on time. I mean, what happens when they express their culture by sleeping in? That's right. And, and that means we're forcing different cultural entities within the company to, to, uh, uh, to live up to expectations, which is yeah, not my, fair. Oh my. Yeah, that's <laughs> that, that is sort of horrific. You know what? We're living. You know the fact that we're living in times where if you started a service company and that was your brand statement and it would kick ass, I'm sure you would get a ton of work. That's the kind of embarrassing world we're living in right now. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> I mean, the old slogan was uh, 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 on time and on budget, and now it's. ESG all the way. Can't really guarantee the on time or on budget stuff, but man, are we inclusive and diverse? <laughs> yeah. Here's a sketch in there. I think use us and that you down. get your ESG points too. That's right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but that is yeah, that is literally the sales pitch. That's true. You're you're right. Yeah, it's a I mean, sad, of, sad time we're living. And, and in. all of, like all these companies who uh, like, for instance, if you are like a contractor for someone working for Amazon or someone that wants an Oscar or something like that, I mean, it's not enough that they have policies. They even need like third-party contractors 
that to have their ESG scores in order. So they'd probably value someone that could give them those ESG scores rather than to deliver the the product on time and on budget. If they have the option between the two, depending on the company, yeah, this is a time and budget. That's not that's a nice bonus. Not so important. Well, companies are are lazy, and the larger the company, uh, I've learned this as a consultant, is that dinosaurs like dancing with dinosaurs, because often also the consulting company becomes the uh, bank of the company that hired them because they won't get paid for six months to a year. So the consulting firms have to be big to be able to uh, 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 not get paid on time. That's why large companies don't work well with small companies because the small companies demand, you know, payment in 30 days. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Then, so this ESG thing plays perfectly well into the dinosaurs dancing with dinosaurs motif. Anyways, so I will leave you with that depressing note. You you finish off on a high note without me, gents and lady. I, I'm counting on you. Yes. Well, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we'll be speaking again on uh, Monday. I know, because I'm going in for my eye operation. That is true. Then we will be having you in our thoughts on Monday, and we will be sending you positive thoughts and good uh, well wishes, and we'll have you back whenever you can turn the computer on. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, Paul. Take care. And uh, then I believe we are uh, caught up uh, with the Super Chat. Of course, Dark King uh, must have missed us going through his uh, his uh, first Super Chat, one that we started with there. Uh, so let's do it one more time. So the force is female. But then what is a woman? And yeah, that, uh, that was the question, uh, which doesn't really have an answer. So maybe the force is they them. Yeah, well, that's what we were joking about that whole time, yeah. It's that... definitely not male, though, that's for certain. Why can't the Force be Mexican? Uh, oh, they don't, don't have those in Star Wars, I forgot. Or do we? I don't know. I'm confused. No, nah, well, that's in Marvel. There you're blue and underwater. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you again, Dark King. We appreciate that. And uh, yeah, so did we, you said we're caught up now on Super Chats? We are not. Oh, we got a couple no, more we here? We have a few more left. Let's get to those. We got White Beard Sky Daddy who says, you guys and the creators and chatters you bring together equal my awesome entertainment. I fully agree with Mike. That culture is so twisted, they're blind. Mental illness turned Lucasfilm to Pucasfilm. Yeah, uh, sadly, culture is already left by the time you sent this, but... Uh, uh, or you mean that culture? No. <laughs> oh, I thought joke. you meant the mental illness part. Yeah. Well, I, I think he is. I think he's. He did. I was Mike. making a joke, yeah. but it didn't land. <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. Zephyr says, uh, "In in this person trans or is this person trans or non-binary? They are not the same. Non-binary means uh, attention. Prove me wrong. You know, I I misspoke. I, I misremembered it. Is it was actually trans, not." Uh, Jack Hudson uh, has been a member for 26 months at the Midnight level. Thank you so much. And hopefully we may see you Sunday on our member stream. Uh, and I might pop in for that, even though I'm on vacation, <laughs> just like I did today. So uh, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, uh, anything else? Yeah, uh, I hope you docket? enjoyed your vacation because you're not getting another. So <laughs> I guess not. I mean, my vacation never really happens. Well, you have to actually take it. Tom. Well, I am. Well, them. Mike and I actually did have a little conversation this morning. We are going to do something soon. Yep. Yep. You heard it so. here first. This is the first time in two or three years I've actually gotten you to admit that it's actually going to happen. In we don't know if it's going to be in Hilton Head or if we're going to go out to Vegas and we're going to do a, a show out there with the guys at the, the Popcast or the Pop I think that uh, Salty Nerd, Salty Nerd, po Nerd Podcast uh, Podcast Studios or whatever and uh, whatnot. But we'll do something. That would be awesome. Would I think be we should do I think that's what we're going to do because I'm going to be on the West Coast in about a month. And then and I was Mikey and Tom in Vegas would be crazy. Mikey and Tom in Vegas. Mead from Vegas. And then we'll, the next morning we'll do the live show. When, when are you talking about? What the time? Third, than the, later, third, the third, probably the fourth week in, uh, in July. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. That's oh, wow. the, He's or, already pre planning it for that, me. That's a little bit too early for me, unfortunately. Well, like we, can make, yeah. we, can, we can make it August. We can make it happen. August. August. I, we haven't really planned anything in stone yet. Yeah, we yeah. can do it the last, any time the last two weeks of August or September. Andre, meet us there. It would be so awesome. It would be awesome. And you know what? Now I actually can go. So, okay, not because, so I, have, not because what... I have done anything different. I stood by my guns the whole time, but now they're letting people who stood by their Script, guns. Script, do you still have to go again. through Mexico? No. Okay. No, 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 no. You better be here too then. All of us can. Canada's uh, been able to tra out. travel and not anyone in there longer than the United States in a surprise change of. of Six can just pick me up on the way. Didn't you just get a new car? I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you heard it here, everybody, That the 15, 1,600 of you that are still here listening, you heard it here. There is going to be a Midnight's Edge live cast in Vegas from the Salty Nerd Pod. We, we probably should ask Kadish first. I but... don't think we have to. <laughs> All right, so, so, the, so we'll we just gonna, show up and surprise We are going to make this happen. <laughs> We're going to do Midnight's Edge in the morning and a mead. Uh, yes, a road show. Vegas. That would be amazing, yes. Yes. Yeah. No, actually, uh, my car is supposed to be going in today. Sadie, Sadie got her stitches out yesterday, so hopefully, how is she? Yeah, she's doing well. She the, the doctor said that she did a good job with her stitches. Actually, yeah. Luckily, they were kind of uh, the only thing they said is that they were worried about with her tail and stuff because a couple of them got on her tail. But no, it looked like everything came out good. So, so no more cone. No more cone. She's out of the cone awesome. of shame. She is so happy not being in that cone of shame. I kind of let her go free most of the last day anyway because. It was just so chaotic. She wasn't really bugging it anyway. So, uh, but with that, what do we got left, Andre? I, I missed the first few stories, which I didn't watch Star Trek and whatnot anyway. So, you didn't no, miss we are actually yeah. uh, we are actually caught up. It was a relatively slow news day, uh, so we even brought don't up jinx some, us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so no, no, we are actually we are actually fully caught up with both new stories, reviews, and uh, and everything we have. So, uh, uh, the final thing to say is that maybe uh, maybe um, membership stream on uh, Sunday, uh, unless Tom has vacation then. Um, well, like I said, I could try to be back around it's here. Another time of day. What time is it? Two, that? three o'clock at the latest. If I can try. If not, if that's difficult, it'll maybe next Tuesday. Well, I think six was planning for Sunday, so if we don't do it by well, Sunday, I actually work this weekend. Oh, Tuesday so would you rather us do it Tuesday? Oh, Tuesday, Honestly, then. I'll be available to help on Tuesday. Why don't Sunday, we do it Tuesday then? If Tuesday, nobody else minds. Tuesday. Yeah, we'll do it Tuesday. Done. No offense, but for the amount of crap that six does around here, we kind of have to abide by what she says in certain cases. Uh, <laughs> well, I just. For, for everybody listening who's thinking about um, joining it, what I do is I set up a live uh, a stream yard, basically a, a live stream, but not live. So you can come in, check your microphone, check your camera if you want to. You don't have to yes. have a camera on, but you do need earbuds. Mm -hmm. And I can help you walk through the audio to make sure your audio is good. And if you've never gone on a live stream before, please look for that link or message me. I'm more than happy to help people have a successful time yeah. on the panel. It's really cool being on a panel for the first time. And that's the thing is like, it's priceless or however you want to put it, the help that you give us there, because that makes a big difference. Um, and it makes sure you guys can come in and actually talk to us. And we're not spending most of our time just trying to deal with tech issues. Um, so, yeah. So hopefully you guys can join us. Then we'll do it on Tuesday. Um, yeah. We normally do it right around the same time as a morning show, so I'd anticipate it be close to that. And I bet we didn't do our sponsor, did we? Uh, this is correct. Yes. Oh. So let's do it now. <sighs> Andre, Andre, Andre. We have a sponsor, Andre. I should have yeah. remembered my bad. I'll take the heat on that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all right. I'm going to make a post-it note and hang it up on my computer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to – actually, it was funny you say that, Six. I was going to say, is there any way you can start reminding me about this? <laughs> <laughs> I do just fine on me, but the morning show, it's so hectic we're – you know, in 20 different directions. But yeah. So, all right. Check out Flip City. Friends, if you're looking for real old school laughs, you're in for a treat because we've got them right here. Flip City Magazine. Remember Mad Magazine? Then it went woke? Well, don't worry. Flip City has no chance of going woke. That's right. 
Four times a year, you'll get an actual printed magazine full of jokes, stories, comics, and more, all about today's pop culture, entertainment, and woke politics. Flip City takes terrible entertainment trends we love to hate with hilarious parodies of Lord of the Rings, Stranger Things, The Walking Dead, Star Trek, Hunters, and more. Trust me when I say there is nothing else like Flip City on the market. So subscribe today. It will be delivered in print. Or you can even get it digitally if you're one of those wacky Zoomers. Either way, follow our link and sign up today. And if you put in midnight, you get an extra 10% off. Check out Flip City Magazine today. And I want to thank all you guys who have signed up already. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it seems that our first uh, few weeks of the campaign have been a success so far. And, and with our sponsor, or however you want to put it, that's not really a campaign. So It is an ad campaign, I guess. Uh, but I'm going to work on some new ads. So hopefully we'll yeah. have some more to, to play. And do check it out because it's glorious humor that is not at all but it's not at all compromised, let's put it that way. And the quality you know, is a big thing, too. Yeah. Go ahead. Crack used to be funny, and then they went woke. And this magazine, <laughs> this ain't going woke. Because there's some of the stuff that you see right there in that trailer, like like some of that art, like, it's like, dang, that's pretty good art. You know? Uh, so it's definitely up to the up to par with what Cracked and definitely Mad used to be in, on that sense. And it's similar in the tone and, and the way it works and... Uh, there's all kinds of different sections to it. There's comics. There's other jokes and bits and all that kind of business. And um, yeah, so check it out, guys. And actually, Kitty of uh, Flip Magazine is going to be joining uh, the the ladies on Toxic Femme on Monday night. So you get to meet one of the people behind uh, Flip City Magazine. It's an actual lady. And uh, yeah, and as I just said, uh, Sander, thanks again, all of you, for your help with Sadie. She got the stitches out yesterday, so she's a okay. Everything checked out. Um, my car, on the other hand, is still under the knife, <laughs> so I'll find out soon, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I do believe spare parts is an issue these days. That's part of it, and the other part of it is this guy was just so busy he didn't get it in until I guess today. That's good because if he's busy, he's probably well. That's stop kind of it six is this is like one of the only people around that we can kind of trust <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and uh speaking of six she's now a member yeah i when i you mentioned i had i just bought a new car i had to cancel every oh, membership right. i had i was trying to figure out my finances and i just kind of panicked and i just cut out all discretionary well spending. you know so, you don't have to do that anymore. no I'm, i know but i i want to i want to support you guys um i know it's important to you and uh I'm, I'm happy to do it, and I'm able to, so I'm it. grateful for that. All right. Well, thank you so much. And Tipping Barn sent in a 499 Super Chat and says, I think the wish casting in regards to KK isn't so much as to repair Star Wars. It's dead. But to actually see someone get hoisted by their petard? Yep. Probably. Well, they, they want to see someone to be held accountable for the, the, the death of, uh, of Star Wars. And now Indiana Sadly, Jones. that's never going to happen. Of course not. That's not how the world works, <laughs> especially in Hollywood. Sadly, you're right. But yeah, all right. With that, I think we're caught up. Um, I, I think some koalas are getting dry, Andre. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So it is time to say thanks to everyone for, uh, for watching today. We will have more videos over the course of the weekend. I do believe we will be back again on Monday. Check out all of the panelists. Link is in the description. Check out Flip City Magazine. And with that, it is time for some koalas in the rain after this last minute super chat from miguel farah he says put no, it's all right that's my fault he says pointless last minute super chat guess the reason hmm what koalas <laughs> yes koalas in the rain koalas in the rain no fucks given koala koala koalas in the rain